Yeah, let me just start recording again. Okay, um, so coming back, it's probably going to be a, a big difference in terms of where we dropped off and where we're continuing, but we're just exploring EVM scripts right now. And so I think what I was talking about the just these four bytes here and just getting into the rest of the bytes, right? So yeah. these four, again, are, are one. They, they map to uh, the first EVM script executor, um, which is going to be call scripts right now. And then we see here this next bit of data is just the finance app. I think, really? Oh no, I need the Xerox gone. So if I do this, you'll see that they map perfectly. That's just the finance address. And then from here on, it's just the length, uh, probably up to here. And then the rest of this is the, actually no, it's probably up to here. Yeah, this is the length. And then the rest of this will be, um, will be the actual call data that gets sent into finance. And that data down here is going to correlate to the vote that we actually saw. This one here, um, it's gonna correlate exactly to, to these people. If we look at this address again as well, um, I don't know if this is gonna work, yeah. You'll see that this address is represented in this byte string, which is a good indication that it is exactly what it's talking about. So there's the, the parameter here, and then there's another parameter for the amount that's getting transferred. And then there's going to be a byte string at the end um, talking about the, the, the string here, the invoice string. And that's most likely this one here. If I went and took this and did the ETF8 transform again, that's probably mapping to the invoice string. So, yeah, these, these are quite powerful, the VM scripts. They're a lot of what um, what the dynamicism of an organization is built upon, as well as the governance schemes. And all of the permissioning is basically enabled by the fact that we can create these envelopes of information and pass them off one at a time. And it's kind of like packets. You like get a packet, you kind of see where it's for, and then you route it to the next one, route it to the next until you get to the destination at which point like you actually do something with it. Um, and that again is, is just kind of, it's kind of here, the description, each envelope, and then to the actual execution, which actually does something meaningful. Um, da -da. Yeah, that was quite a lot. Um, well, yep. Uh, why is the, or why is the voting app, the one that can encode them? And is this something that you need to implement in your app, like uh, an interface or something? Yes. So, in terms of in terms of getting this capability in Aragon app itself, uh, if I go to the voting app, let's go to the voting app. So yeah, in the voting app, we have two things. We have the fact that it derives from an Aragon app. If I go to an Aragon app, you'll see that we have the EVM script runner. This EVM script runner, which is built into each Aragon app, um, it has this function run script. And this function is just takes a script, takes a potential input, takes a blacklist of addresses that it should never call for security reasons, and runs it against effectively just call script right now. And all of this implementation is just doing that. If we look in voting, if we look at run script, it only comes here. So when we execute a vote, um, title unsafe for internal do documentation purposes, uh, but when you go and execute a vote, effectively you just get the vote, you get the execution script that's embedded. So that would map directly to this and then it just runs it and then it says oh look I've, I've run it so in terms of the implementation for an app itself it's really really simple all they need to do is expose a way for people uh, users uh, or programmatically for us to uh, take a script as input 
and then at some point in the future, run that script. The difference with voting and something like Token Manager uh, is that there's different forms of uh, what I call the script execution. There's there's two forms, one of which is synchronous and one of is one of which is asynchronous. The synchronous happens instantaneously in that same transaction, and asynchronous happens um, separately in a delayed execution. So voting is asynchronous. When you create the vote, it may sometimes, but will not always execute the vote in the same transaction. For example, if you need 10 people to vote and you create this vote, you're going to have to wait for a few more of these people to vote before the script gets executed. That's why it's asynchronous and non-instant. The token manager, if you look at its run script, happens immediately. So forwarding is something unrelated kind of to this, and it's a different API that gets built in Aragon apps. Um, but effectively, you can see that if I call forward, it calls run script immediately. And so this is what I mean by synchronous or instantaneous execution of that script. And, and tokens, they just like do a check that you can actually, you actually have tokens uh, on the related token manager or token net uh, contract. So for example, but the tokens app uh, is not able to execute uh, like script, a multiple script. Uh, uh, yeah, a multiple script uh, executing execution because it can decode it or it can decode and execute it. I mean, for example, because in the voting app, I see it more clearly how you can. Uh, have several uh, actions to be executed, like the example that you show. But I can see clearly how the tokens app mm -hmm. can do something similar. Yeah. So the important thing to realize in these two is that the run script it looks exactly the same, right? It's just one run script call with the script. Both of these are more or less the same, just bytes, inputs. Yeah. Um, so with the token manager, when you get this input, this EBM script input, if you encode two actions in this EBM script, when you run the script, the tokens will actually execute those two actions. Okay. So an example might be, um, if you just wanted your organization to, uh, yeah, like let's say you had an organization where you wanted any token member to be able to transfer funds. Um, you could encode two transfers into the same EBM script, send it to the token app, VI forward, and it would just run these scripts. And at the end of it, in that same transaction, you would have done two, tra two transfers uh, from the financer vault or agent applications, depending on how that org is set up. Okay, so yeah, because in this sense, I see in, in my head at least at this point, as I understand it, it seems more like maybe because it, the tokens behaves like a forwarder, uh, but I see, I see it more the token as a, as a path, path through a, mm -hmm. a app, more, yep. more like a not executor itself. Yep. Yeah, it really depends on how the user or the organization wants to use the tokens app. Um, what we have right now, for example, is you have to be a token member of the organization to create votes. Yeah. Uh, but if we wanted to, we could create two votes um, using the same transaction from any or the default organizations that we have right now. Uh, okay. Um, okay, yeah. Makes so sense. The main reason of doing that is not that great. It'd just be saving a bit of gas, but you can kind of generalize yeah, yeah, yeah. that, right? Yeah, I understood that. I think so. Yeah. Okay. All right. Should we continue onwards? I know it's um, 
getting a little bit yeah. farther. <laughs> we can also take a break if we'd like before we jump into uh, everything about Aragon JS, which is going to be another, um, yeah, <laughs> another big portion of this. Yeah, all good. Should think? we just continue? Sorry. Yeah, all good. Okay. Yeah, all good. All right. So this is kind of where it gets to the fun part and where we get to apply hopefully everything that we talked about above. Um, the whole point of the first two topics was really to uh, build an understanding of both how Ethereum works and how on-chain organizations work, uh, or, or our on-chain organizations work and how they're laid out. And now effectively on the off-chain segment, we're gonna talk about how we extract information to feed it into the front end. Uh, because you can see we have quite a front end here that shows you a lot of information. Um, it can tell you a bunch of things, a bunch of contract addresses, uh, all sorts of versions, etc. cetera. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things going on in the back end of how we're getting that information. Now, let me just, uh, let me keep this open. I'll close this, close that. Okay. So the first thing to discuss is just, um, yeah, just the split between the information sources uh, in the client, Aragon JS and Aragon apps. Uh, each of these is effectively mapped to a repo and they serve different purposes in the front end. Um, so the Aragon client is the shell of this application, this front end that we have. Uh, it effectively, like in reality, it's just the top bar and it's just the sidebar for the most part. Um, some of these systems apps are also included. Of course, the preferences are also included, etc. But when you have these actual applications up here, none of these, well, home is, but tokens voting finance, for example, here, uh, all of them are completely separate apps that are unrelated to the client. Um, don't know. OneHive, maybe we can see. Yeah, not quite, huh? Where's another one? Gabby, do you know what the OneHive um, org is? Yeah. B. Oh, uh, Beehive. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so you'll see in, in different organizations, they might have totally different apps. Uh, for example, OneHive, they have four new apps, um, essentially, that are non, not part of the client. They're just installed separately. Uh, Aragon.js is kind of this middle layer that connects everything. Uh, this is the guy. There's a couple of packages inside here, but this is the... The, the middleware, as I call it, that will extract information from the chain, everything above, and feed that into the front ends and flush, uh, flush all of this information out here. Uh, and then the Aragon apps are each of these individual applications that we see here. Um, we have a bunch at Aragon apps, the repo. Um, OneHive also has a bunch of applications that they've developed. So, yeah, you'll see here that we have effectively a bunch of applications, each of which map to one of these. And then one hive, you'll see a couple of separate repos. All of these repos with the dash app name are individual applications that also are part of this experience. Um, but again, as I said at the very start, um, Building these applications is really about building into the organization. So all of these apps are a part of the organization. And right now what we're trying to do is build something on top that may not necessarily add additional functionality into these organizations, but they'll provide a better experience. Um, they'll be able to programmatically do things against these installed applications. Uh, and they'll kind of be able to provide better user experiences. Um, more cohesive ones with all of the contracts involved uh, than just having really fragmented experiences between each of the individual apps as they are. Okay, let me get this a closer. So 
Yeah, in terms of Aragon JS, um, we can. This is really where we get into the code, I'd say. And the things I wanted to touch on were just the split of what is inside Aragon JS right now. Uh, so the first thing is about what is considered first class state from Aragon JS, uh, and what I mean by first class is it's fetched directly um, from. Aragon JS without you having to ask for it. And this is most likely the same information that we would want to expose to people integrating um, on top of organizations. And then we have a couple of APIs that I've named client facing now uh, because they're more or less only used by the client and they've extended the functionality set that we have in this front end, uh, but may not be really relevant for most other people um, who use different things are building their own front ends. Uh, next is about the app state and about how applications themselves get information. And really the thing is how app state is considered, I guess, second class compared to what would be first class uh, state that we talk about. And then, um, and then finally is the caching strategy. And just a brief touch on some of the non-deterministic topics that we talked about before, um, as well as how we currently go about caching, uh, caching things, caching state and information in the front end uh, to make things load a little bit faster. So Aragon.js, the not nice thing about Aragon.js is it's effectively 2000 lines of a single file. It's like um, the, the Hydra, Octopus, God, file now that runs all of Aragon uh, front ends. And the, the great thing about this is you can see it in one file and you can, like, you can take a giant screenshot and then start drawing things on it without having to jump in too many other places. The not so nice thing about it is that it's really difficult to work with. Um, but, but let's focus on the nice things and we can focus on like, you know, the fact that I can just talk about this in a sequential manner without going through multiple different files. Um, so, the first thing about Aragon.js is just how we, how we create, how, how we start everything, right? The, the first thing is just init, we're going to create this object, and this object essentially sets up all of the APIs that we have available. And effectively, each of these, uh, we have the cache, the kernel proxy, accounts, ACL, etc. All of these are either state or they're observables. Um, because as with events, yeah, okay. events are essentially a stream of information and observables encapsulate that stream of information really well. They are fully reactive, so that means when we get new events, um, we can emit new information. And we'll see that very clearly as we get into it. Uh, if I just talk about the, the client-facing APIs right now, we have... Uh, Signatures, transactions, intents, GUI style, network, app identifiers, um, identity providers, and the cache. All of those are primarily used for the client and other perhaps clients who, who may want those features, uh, but are not at all useful for, uh, for, for other people who are just interested in what an organization looks like on chain. Um, um, Intents as well. I thought intents were more general. Yeah, I'd say intents are part of the client API for now, um, because with the new set of tooling, we would most likely want a different API structure. Like we wouldn't want an observable for the intents. Um, I imagine most people we should lift this responsibility to the end user, uh, who then builds their own sort of state around transaction pathing and which transactions they're getting put in the queue. Um, because this was a this was effectively made to like, um, it's kind of weird. It's just like, yeah, I want to do something and I don't know where that state is. So I'm going to put it in this observable for, for the client to get. Um, and the client is really driven by this. But uh, I think for most front ends, that pattern isn't going to be very, very useful. I think most people will just want to say, oh yeah, I have a transaction that I want to do. The user has done something. I want to go figure this out. I can route the state myself 
I'm going to show whatever I need to to have people sign it. Um, and so we probably don't want to expose some observable for people to have their um, uh, their transactions driven by instead of yeah, it's kind of like push versus pull. We don't want to push that. Rather, we yep. want people to, to interact directly with the set of tooling um, to, to like just do that on their own, handle that on their own. OK, makes sense. Um, OK, so we can ignore quite a lot of this at the beginning. The, the first part where it gets interesting is init ACL. So how, what this does is we, we see that this, this takes the ACL address. And as we saw before with the organization, um, we can go from here. We can go from the kernel. If we look at the kernel, da, 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 da. I get it. Let me, let me go back to A1 because that's been already set up properly. All right, the other thing we should notice is that there's a bunch of options. Um, I believe the kernel proxy gets built here. So we pass it, first of all, we pass it the DAO address and uh, from the DAO address, we can actually um, get the ACL address through a call. Um, this is an ETH call and where do I show that? Um, yeah, this under the hood, this call is the ETH call. Um, that's what it does and the return object where the return data gets put back as just an address and it lives here. Um, so that we can see that on Etherscan just very quickly here. Go from the kernel. If we read as proxy, we'll see here that we call um, where is it? The init kernel proxy that call ACL. If we look for ACL, this is what we get back. And um, let me actually run this and do this. And the kernel proxy is a uh, API that you that we wrap in the to interact with the with what we with what we think. Sorry, say that again. We, we wrap this with Web3. I mean, the, the, the kernel, kernel proxy is yes. a API that you wrap around to use yes. it. Yeah, so kernel proxy, as we see it, the way Aragon.js does this, um, there's a bit of indirection. Uh, but at the very end of the day, all we have when we do a make proxy is a Web3 contract. So we just have web3.eth.contract. And when we do this, we have a high upper utility that fetches us the ABI based on the kernel name, and that will create the, the contract. And then when we do any calls, if we see here, uh, it just does a Web3 um, methods invocation. Okay, let me quit this. Okay. Yes. All right. So if I do that and I go a bit further up. So you see I'm loading A1 and when I go into it if I look at the DAO address, um, how do I make this a bit bigger? Maybe this will help. If I look at the DAO. If I look at the DAO address, it's just six three five one, and of course this is this value there. And if we go a bit further, you can see that we're doing the call now. And if we just go a bit further, oh shit, I lost it. Um, Maybe, no, I do have it. So ACL address, you'll see that this is the value that we get back from that call. And again, uh, if we look back here, I believe this should be the same. 
How come it's not the same? F A A. Yeah, okay. F if I do this. We'll see that these two map up correctly here. All right. Now we can continue going and So yeah, so we've initted, we've got our DAO address, we've got our ACL address. Um, the first thing we're pretty much going to do is init the ACL. And what this will do is, this is the, the most important thing that the wrapper does right now. And this is what I would consider the first class state um, that is exposed by the, the, the or Aragon.js, the tooling. Um, so when we get this, we're going to make any uh, Web3 contract. Uh, again, it's going to be the ACL proxy. That's going to allow us to get logs as well as call into it. So we're specifically interested in two logs right now, and then we have a bit of caching. Uh, ignore kind of the caching, but effectively what we have here, if we go through the cat, get past the caching, is we're calling past events. And what past events does is it basically tells the node to do that algorithm with get logs, right? So it does this and it's telling it, go through all the blocks, go through all the blockchain and find me the relevant events that I've defined. Um, where am I? Up here. So pretty much we have the to block, we have the from block. So if we just uh, simplify it a little bit, let's say we have the to block of two to four and we're only interested in some events, let's say these red events, then it's gonna go look through from here onwards and it'll do the bloom filter search and uh, it'll say, okay, block two doesn't have anything relevant, but block three and block four look like they do and there's a bunch of events in these transactions that are relevant to what we're looking for with these event types. Um, now, as it does this, it's going to go reduce them. So it gets the past events and then uh, it effectively comes here. And this scan is very much the same as, a, um, as kind of what Ethereum does. It basically carries over state and allows you to apply additional logic on top of it, save the state and carry over more state. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of run into that and we'll debug this a little bit to see what happens. Uh, but as each event happens, scan gets called once and then we run a bunch of logic. And this logic here creates a data structure. Uh, we can kind of see here where we build an object that has keys of app, which then map to another object with keys of roles, which then map to another object, which contains all of the useful information that we want to expose to users. Uh, the manager of the role, the allowed entities, and the entities with permission. And this entire function basically just maps this. So if I go through a little bit, we'll see here, when we get to get past events, uh, past events options. Just checking, uh, Pierre, can you see the bottom here? Is that fairly good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we'll see here. Uh, we want events from this two block. Actually, it's probably cached ACL state. Oh, I don't have anything. Great. So good news, I'm starting from scratch. Um, so we'll see the whole thing. Now, what happens, as I was saying, this is the, the from block and to block. Um, oh, actually, the past events here is a bit of a, a, a catching strategy that we can talk about afterwards. Um, but yeah, it's basically saying we only want to get events from A to, actually, this is kind of, this is not good. I think this should be using this 
should be using the initialization state. Anyhow, that might be something to check. Um, but yeah, it's, it's essentially scoping the blocks to look at and it's saying, okay, I'm gonna go look up to here. And then the next one, the current events, it's going to look from this part onwards and, uh, and, and get us the current block that we're currently fetching from. If we go here, this is the giant scan fetched permissions, fetch permissions. Uh, what's effectively happening is we're saying, please put all of the past events ahead of the current events and we'll reduce them in that order. So first of all, we're going to see the events here and then we're going to see the events that are emitted after that. Uh, and again, it's because if we look at it, um, the way this works right now, it's like past events, we're saying get me one and two, and then the second operation is get me three and four. Uh, and we can say three and four are current, and these two are past. So if we do that, we'll see that, okay, we did get an event, this event, turn values, it has a whole bunch of information. And the relevant ones we see entity app role, all of which map to up here. We're just going to do a bunch of things there. Um, where is the uh, permissions? Permissions. So if we look, permissions at the start is a empty array. Now if I play forward this once, permissions is an object with one key, which has an object of one key and then has allowed entities. And that's because the last event that we saw held this data and it was a set permission uh, event. And so we said, okay, looks good. It's for this app, it's for this role. This entity is allowed. And so it maps down through here. This was the app, the role, the allowed entities. If we play this forward again, uh, event.return values, We'll see the next one. It's another set, uh, set, um, set permissions event. If I do event. Yeah, we can see here. This is the from address FAA that would map to the ACL address, and we have here the event name change permission manager. And now this is change permission manager, and the results are going to be it's going to tell me, okay, I have a manager set for this app, uh, for this app and role. And so if we play this forward, permissions right now is this. It's just the allowed entities. If we play it forward, what we'll see now is not just allowed entities, but the manager has been set. Uh, we can keep doing this. You can see that this event here, it's going to be for a set permission. And it's going to be probably for a different application or it might be for a different entity that's allowed. So if we play forward, we look at permissions. Now this will have changed. Now we have two allowed entities in this array. So we can continue doing this over and over and over again. Um, but what we eventually get, if I can find a good place, and is probably not a good place here. Yeah, so if I go here, uh, after all of that has been done, if I look at the permissions at the end of the day, You'll see we have quite a large object with a bunch of applications. Each of these applications has a number of roll bytes. For example, this one has two, the previous ones have one. C905 maps to not one of these. Um, let me find a one. 38DA. 38DA is the finance app. If we go to the permissions, you'll see finance. It has a bunch of permissions, three of which have been assigned to voting. And you'll see here that indeed 
they are all voting and their manager is voting. Uh, so that's the end of that operation there in this ACL. And this is, again, the most important first class state that we have to provide. Uh, because with this mapping of apps to roles to allowed entities, this is effectively how we start building out the whole graph of what an on-chain organization looks like. If we take this and we simplify it a little bit, we effectively get to... Hmm. What happened here? We effectively can get to this state. Uh, so just by looking at this already now, we more or less have all of the contract addresses that we care about and all of the ways that they're hooked up together. Um, and that's represented here. We could find a perhaps better representation for this when we go to build uh, this new set of tooling, but that's kind of what we have. Now the, the next part is the apps. So you'll see fetch permissions. It gets set to the permissions. So this dot permissions. Now this dot permissions is going to get used a couple places. The next place it gets used is when we init apps. So you'll see it directly comes from this dot permissions. That means whatever information gets sent to uh, this observable, the permissions observable, it's going to continue from there via the pipe. Um, so it's going to do a bunch of operations, but effectively, uh, let's see if I can go to doing this. I go to source. I go here. Yeah, if I go here, we can start. And refresh. Hmm. I wonder why this. Does that work out? All right, there we go. Let's type that stuck. Okay, so yeah, you can tell we we're knitting, we're creating this contract. Or sorry, we're creating the Aragon JS wrapper. Uh, we're gonna go through the init process. And then we're going to go through the ACL. So we're in init ACL right now. And so you can tell that the ACL is where it starts because we haven't got to init apps yet. Now, when we go to init apps, we're going to be here and we have this dot permissions that pipe. When we get here, we will just set a breakpoint here and we'll see when this gets triggered. It is going to be after that. So permissions, we got the permissions. Um, so these fired, and then afterwards, this fired. So this is how the pipe works. The permissions, we put information into it. Um, it emitted some information. We managed, like we did some work on that in the handler for. Uh, or the listener for that observable. And then we have another one here for the pipe, which is listening to that information and then running more operations on it as we go. So with this pipe, basically, it's a very large set of operations that happen. And it's, it's a little bit uh, difficult to work with, to be honest. Uh, but what we have is we, we start getting the object.keys, right? So object.keys, if we look at permissions, um, it's not going to give me this, is it? Uh, proxies. Yeah, if we look at here, 
if we look at the permissions, each of these keys is an app address. And so that's why we do object.keys to get all of the app addresses that are relevant. And then we start pushing that down through these operations. Um, we do a bit of optimizations, uh, a bit of um, sanitizing and, and additional nice things to get it to work. Here there's the proxy for the kernel uh, that we treat as an application, um, primarily so that we can also treat it as uh, a contract that we know about and we can do transaction packing with. Um, this is a bit of a hack as well, so we may consider not doing this when we get to redo can, this bit. Can you repeat that? Uh, why the, the, the section of the information you get from the, car the kernel app of the app? Yeah, so we added the kernel here into the set of apps, um, so it gets represented whenever we use the set of apps. This is important because some operations happen on the kernel. For example, when you install or do other oper operations directly with the kernel, um, you have to know about that uh, existing. And to simplify it a little bit, we've just added the kernel as the first app in the list. Um, this isn't so this isn't quite true to, to reality and how we should probably think about the kernel, um, but it, it's like a cute little hack that we were able to do to simplify how we represent the state and how it gets pushed to the client. Um, because this, this is the, apps, yep. No, I was wondering if this was also an optimization for the amount of fetching that you need to do? Or? So it is not an optimization for the fetching. It was really just a development optimization to save a bit of time. Um, it was a shortcut that probably costs us more now in the future that we haven't taken it away. And it's kind of like debt. We took on debt to do this and then we didn't really pay it off and so it's still here. Um, but yeah, so okay. I, I, what this allows us to do, this little bit here at the kernel, is that when we get the, we'll see later on here, um, geez, this is big. Um, where is it? This.apps. When we get here, when we finally get here to this.apps, because the kernel is included there, using this.apps gives us all of the relevant contracts that we might care about. Uh, as part of this observable. And we abuse this a bit inside this library by only using, only needing to use this.apps when we're doing transaction pathing and when we're looking for relevant information. Um, you can kind of see in later parts, when we look at forwarders, we directly use this.apps. When we do transaction pathing, I'm actually surprised. Yeah. Yeah, when we do transaction pathing, when we look at a destination, we simply look at the app. But the destination may also be, um, so yeah, the destination may also be a kernel. And we were like, well, are we gonna do a big if statement here? If we don't find it inside the apps, do we go check it against the kernel and like all of this and, and like, Okay. So, Years ago, we just decided, screw it, we'll just do this, and, and that's the case. Um, but I think if we were to do this properly, um, we would clearly say the apps are separate from the kernel, and any information that, no, and any, any transaction pathing or other information that we need to do just takes this into account. It checks whether or not it's the kernel, and if, it's, if it is, uh, it knows where to fetch that information, and if not, it, it assumes it's going to be one of the installed applications. Um, and then, you know, whether or not we start considering the ACL kind of as its own thing as well is a different topic that we may talk about, um, because the ACL is effectively also just another app, but it's a very special app 
um, that we could treat separately if we if we wanted to. And there is a bit of complexity here inside the transaction path in um, because of how the ACL works and how it doesn't exactly conform to how a transaction path works. Um, but we can kind of we can kind of talk about that afterwards when we get to transaction path in. There's a couple of, of trade offs. So going back to the apps. This is where Aragon PM gets gets useful uh, because when we look at this code, we see that, okay, we start here, we go from this dot permissions. From the permissions, we get the set of app addresses. From the set of app addresses, um, we do a bit of optimization and then we start doing uh, requests. We both get, uh, we, we do both ETH calls to get more information about the proxy contract itself. And we also do a bit of uh, IPFS fetching. So here we can see that um, the proxy value, the proxy contract value cache and the application info cache. So this, this does all the ETH calls. You'll see here a bunch of dot calls. This gets us more information about that app contract just from its existence, uh, just from its, um, yeah, just from applying the ABI on top and then doing ETH calls on top. And then the next part, the application info would cache. You, uh, one, before, before going forward, would you mind uh, explain the object structure of this proxy value? Uh, sorry, what is the... I mean that the, all the ETH calls, what object they return, I mean, mm -hmm. with the proxy contract value. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we can actually see this if I get a good handle on it. Um, hmm. Yeah, this might be a bit painful, but let's see. So... I'm gonna do this, permissions updated, da, 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 da. It's gonna do some fetching. Hopefully this hits, it's not hitting. Um, let me see what I'm doing wrong. Yeah, it should. And one, one quick question is, uh, what is the part of the app that we need to, to get things like transaction pattern? I thought only with the ACL graph was much, was not many, many more. Yes, so, so we kind of need two things or maybe more than two things for transaction pathing. And we'll see that in the algorithm when we get there. But effectively, we one need to know whether or not it's a forwarder or whether some applications are special and that they're forwarders. And then the next thing we need to do is, um, is check the permissions. And okay. there's kind of like two ways of checking the permissions. One is the cheap way. By reducing the ACL state, we can build a graph and then we can test against that graph to see whether or not, okay, there is a path that exists and henceforth, it looks like a pretty good idea. Like this should work. And then the more expensive check is to do an ETH call with the actual transaction to run to see whether or not that path will exist. Uh, and you'll see, we kind of have both strategies applied, um, but we, in, in Aragon.js right now, but we, have some parts where we could optimize a bit better, I think, with more of the ACL information. Um, right now, we're kind of brute forcing the algorithm a bit. Okay, so about the proxy contract value cache, uh, yeah, you can see here we're, we're inside the call, yeah. and then we'll actually see where this goes. This is a kernel, and what happens when we do this is 
it effectively returns this value. Now, if I try to step in and step in, and do I get the return? I'm trying to get this return here. Let's step in, step in, step in, and then out. And maybe we're going to get the, the return value. Yeah, return. Ah, oh, no. OK, it's a promise, so I can't really get into it. Um, yeah, that's a problem. OK, unfortunately, I can't really <laughs> no see this no value uh, outside of um, yeah, yeah, maybe we can uh, afterwards see the app uh, information. Yeah. Unfortunately, I have completely just like hidden away all the implementation bits from this. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can kind of see here the values. This is the object that gets returned. So for the kernel, we get the app ID, which hopefully it should be the kernel ID. And then we get the code address, which is the implementation address, uh, the implementation contract address. And then you'll see here um, for applications, what we get is the kernel that they're linked to, the app ID that the application is, uh, is about, the implementation address, and then uh, whether or not they're a forwarder. And we have like a special clause here because this can fail if they don't implement this. And so we just have a false. Um, let me see if we can get in somewhere underneath to just get a sense of what this will look like. So maybe here and maybe here, let's see. I stop that. All right, so proxy values. Right, so I got an application here. I am, yep. yeah, effectively on this part of the call, I've just returned from it. And you'll see that I get the kernel address, the FID, the implementation address, and that this is a forwarder. And that means. 658A, it's probably the tokens or the voting. Yeah, so this, we just looked at the voting app inside. So this gets us the on-chain state with ETH calls. And we will see a bit further when we get the uh, IPFS information, if we get that. Maybe not, maybe I've been too slow here. Hmm, interesting. No, this doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll kind of ignore the the IPFS part here, but the fetch latest content for contract, it effectively fetches the manifest and the artifact. Uh, combines the two together and pushes it into the app. So when we look at the apps, when they're fully done, we can see that, uh, for example, the Aragon OS contracts, we have the ABI, we have the name, but we also have the FID, the code address, the proxy address. And so we combine both these on-chain and off-chain states together. Uh, and for an application itself, you can see we have a lot more information. And again, this is more or less the combination of the manifest artifact and on-chain information that we were able to retrieve. Um, yeah, this is a part specifically that makes it really difficult actually for us to work with because we don't have good schemas um, for, for defining where is where. And we should have probably isolated both the artifact and, and manifest from this big blob 
uh, so we could control those a bit better than how we currently just push everything together. Um, it makes it really hard to refactor in the future. And this is important to connect, to actually connect to the apps with the APIs or, exactly. or get information, information relevant to communicate with what's Exactly. With exactly. Or, okay. Yeah. Because the client and most users, I would say, may not have the ABI, the roles, or the route spec functions encoded directly into their applications. Depending on some use cases, they might. So this is less of a problem, um, but it's still better for us to give this information transparently to people who are fetching these apps. Um, and so they know how to handle that. They don't have to go include the ABI file themselves. They can just say, oh yeah, like I've got the apps and if I look at the app, I'm going to look at, I'm going to have the ABI included with it. And so I can just take this object and wrap, use the information included inside of it and wrap it inside a Web3 contract or an Ethers contract and start interacting with that contract um, programmatically. And so I like it because it, it encapsulates everything about that contract in one place. And if we just kind of tell them where to look, they'll be able to, they have everything. They don't need to go to another source, download ABIs or et cetera, um, to be able to interact. Okay. Nice. Okay. So then, yeah, that's pretty much the installed apps. Um, there's a bunch of like other operations that happen here that aren't necessarily relevant. Um, there's a bit here about installing applications, which is, uh, or rather not installing, but updating applications, um, which isn't going to be really relevant, um, for the future. We should probably just detect that based on, um, the app address changing. Um, but anyway, anyway, th this is like not super, super important. I wouldn't really say that this is first class um, state. We probably just want to omit when we see this happening. Uh, well, actually, yeah, I, I think we can talk about how we'd want to let people know whether or not their apps got updated or an app got installed, because that could be something quite interesting. Um, the current way we do it, we just push these finish observables to people, but we don't really talk about the diff. The, the diff is kind of, um, it, it's kind of up to the end user, the client in this case, to understand like, oh, what just happened? If I got new apps, why did I get new apps? Was it because one got installed or one got uninstalled? Um, so we, we may we may think about how we want to show this to the user in the future because there's a bunch of things that can happen related to the on-chain events. Um, an app, a new app may get installed, an old app may get uninstalled, a new permission may happen, an app may get upgraded, all of these things. Um, and potentially there's an API that we can design where the users are kind of getting um, uh, yeah, they're, they're able to listen for these specifically and able to, to detect that something has happened without having to do the manual diff um, based on the previous and current values. But specifically this right now, like the code that's in here, um, it just basically allowed the client to detect, okay, there was an app that got updated and henceforth I need to do something. I need to update the app center, I need to refresh the app etc cetera, etc cetera. you can see here all of it boils down to an updated flag being set in the observable uh, and then there's a lot more information down here and this is um, this is the artifact information that we talked about but we have a lot of repo specific information and this is used by the app center to uh, to detect which applications are installed and get information about those repos. This is how all of this information that we see, the app versions, um, whether or not there's a new app, a uh, new version, all of that information kind of comes from. And it's from uh, taking the, the, the application contracts themselves, 
going through this layer into APM, going there, and then finding the repos that are associated with them and listening to the repo events uh, so that we can detect there's a new version and henceforth, um, yeah, we need, to, we need to expose that to the user that there's been a version increment. Okay, so yeah, that, that about covers it for about the next uh, 400 lines <laughs> or so. And all of this is really related to just fetching the, the repos that are there. Um, and yeah, this is one part that we could probably make a subgraph um, as well. We could probably shuffle all of this into an Aragon PM subgraph uh, yep. if, we, if we took the time to do so and moved it out of here. Um, okay, before, before we go any further, uh, this is, again, what I'd consider the, the first class state. All of this information that's collected here is fed directly to the client and um, is like given regardless of which applications are installed and like just comes by default. Uh, and then we can get into the second class state in a second. Do you, do you consider as well uh, Aragon PM to be first class as, as the kernel and ACL are? Yeah, this I'm a bit undecided about. I, I don't know. Um, and I think we may want to try a couple of designs. The main thing that I'm not sure about is how, how easy do we want to get, how, how easy do we want to make getting information off of uh, Aragon PM? Because on some level, it is really nice if users are just able to do one query um, again, talking about a subgraph, but if we think about it as like a graph API, it's really nice if users are able to just do one query, get all of the organization's installed applications, and with those installed applications, all of their links to Aragon PM uh, filled in for them. Uh, and so that's the thing that I really like about having that be first class, but at the same time, um, I do you see how encapsulating the two are totally different, right? One is just organizations and fully generic information about these organizations, their permissions, their installed apps, et cetera, and just on-chain information. And then the other one is just about Aragon PM. Uh, so as a user, as a developer, you would have to go fetch one and then go from there and say, oh, I'm interested in like the voting and the token manager apps. I'm gonna go fetch more information from them from Aragon PM. And I'm going to go to do another fetch somewhere else to get that information. Um, and that's something we can hide with tooling, but at the same time, like I'm, I'm really not sure. And this is something I think we should really uh, investigate is can we put the two together? And if we do put the two together, does it look really, really bad? Um, do we have a bunch of limitations and would it be easier for us to just make them separate? And, and we're not going to know that un until we start trying to build that uh, as a subgraph or as a graph API. Okay. Yeah, yeah I was taking uh, notes on that, but but, but yeah, yeah, I think it. it we, we need, need to, to figure, figure that out. out. In, in, in my, my head, head at least, uh, I, I see, see a ROPM yeah, more, more like, like a base uh, infrastructure that relies on the on the on, on the, the, the organization, organization information. information. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah. I, I understand your points on on expose the APM information, information for for every other. Yeah, I think it effectively kind of comes down to how we want to scope the information. Um, because as we see on the client right now, what we get when we get the apps is we get both the Aragon PM information as well as the on-chain, strictly on-chain information. Um, so if we want to expose something similar to users, um, yeah, 
you know, as I was saying, we can hide this behind the toolkit and the, the tooling that we create. But at the same time, what does what does that tooling do, right? Does it do two fetches uh, or does it only do one? If it does two, what if one happens, but the other fails? And like the, all of these kind of questions start to happen. And, and I think we just need to try uh, try a couple of designs and do a quick a couple of quick prototypes. Um, see what they look like and then decide from there. Makes sense. Um, yeah, again, I, I do like the encapsulated nature of, of having all this information together because um, then you don't have to go to too many different places to find out how you're supposed to use this installed app. Um, and that's a really nice, um, a really nice uh, feature, I guess, in how the information is currently provided as chaotic as it is. Okay, um, before we jump into what I consider a second class state, uh, I just wanted to have a quick discussion about what parts of this are really slow right now and why we've been talk talking about subgraphs and uh, why that makes sense. So what is slow? If we go back to this diagram, this is really fast. Green, super fast, because all it cares about is current state. This is super trivial for a node to get. It's essentially a key value database. When we do one of these, um, the node can say, okay, I have current state, I'll load it off of either the database, or more commonly, it's already cached in memory. And I'm gonna go either get information from you, or I'm gonna go apply some logic. And again, super fast. It's like just doing one thing, generally like, um, I mean, strictly they're O log of n things in terms of finding the data, finding the, the related state and et cetera. But it's like, you only have to care about one block. And so it's like, O of block one, I guess we could call this. Um, doesn't need any more information, strictly applies to this. Blue, the, the get transactions, these APIs, they're slower. The reason they're slower uh, is unless you use one of the additional helpers. So we see get transaction. There's a couple of get transactions. We see here. So get transaction by hash, by block hash and index, by block number and index, and transaction receipt. These are equivalently the same thing but some of them provide you optimizations. Because if you can imagine just getting a transaction hash, like imagine looking for this, right? There's no order. If we look at this, transactions, there's no order to these transactions. So when we start looking for, uh, where am I here? Completely lost it, yeah. When I'm just looking for the string of, of bytes, like as a node, I just have no idea where this is. Like, all I can do is go look through my internal database and start seeing like where this transaction lives. Um, depending on how the nodes have structured their database, this may be really inefficient. If we look at the if we look at the the way that this is built in a node, you'll see that transactions are essentially an array. They're per block. I mean, it's a little bit better than an array, but per block, uh, we have a set of transactions. And these transactions are just ordered through here. And so the worst case scenario, if we can imagine it, the, the worst case is get transaction goes through every single block and is like, oh, this block, like, is this transaction inside this block? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And when we have like 10 million blocks, this can take quite a while to do. Um, so these ones are, are quite slow until you give it a, a few better parameters. Um, and I, I, I'm sure that ETH nodes do a bit of optimization in their, both their database as well as just some of their logic in terms of uh, what they can apply. Um, there's a little trick here with the transactions route with the Merkle tree where they don't have to go inside each, each transaction and do them one by one. Uh, they can just load the block information and then go and see like, oh, is this transaction part of the root? No, okay, let me go to the next one. But if it is, then they have to kind of go in and, 
and start looking for uh, where that transaction is. So this is like a, an O of N, O of block N operation, blue. Uh, but the nice thing about blue is that there's only one. A transaction can only exist once. Uh, so they might have some heuristics, they might have otherwise some other tricks, but once you've found the transaction, you can return that immediately. And this is where we get to ETH logs and why ETH logs are super, super slow and why without the help of Infura and their ability to cache logs on their end for us, it takes minutes, like hours at this point to get some of the oldest uh, organizations. Because if we just connect to a node and we do get logs and we're searching through three, four, five million blocks to get all the relevant events, this is going to be really slow. Get logs is like the worst of, of both, or rather just a, a strictly worse version of blue. Uh, because get logs, what it has to do is it has to go through each block, go through them one by one, check against the bloom filter, and then if there's a hit, it has to go inside that bloom filter, that, sorry, that block, go inside the transaction receipts, and then start looking. Like, does this transaction have a relevant log? If it does, no, uh, I'll, I'll keep it. If it doesn't, I'm gonna throw it away and look at the next one. Uh, and once it gets here, it's pretty much just iterating through an array. Um, but the problem is, in terms of get logs, there's, there's no way to know when to end outside of exhausting all opportunities. So between blue and red, you can see that blue, like if there's a hundred blocks, uh, let's say just on average, you're only going to be checking about half of those um, to get your transaction because it can only exist once. But with get blogs, you're going to have to search through the entire list of, of blocks because you never know when it's going to end. And so these events continually can happen and you, you just can't stop until you've looked through everything. And of course, when, you, when you're looking through gigabytes of data, this is not a fast operation to do. And so when we look at our code and we look at past events, every time, not even past events, we can just do events. Anytime we fetch events, whether it's past events or dot events, this is a really, really, really slow operation. Uh, and you know, if we weren't using Infura and you tried to load the organization, uh, an old organization, uh, it could take like tens of minutes for these two uh, API calls to return. Um, and then only from that point onwards do we get to go forward and see what the ACL is, what the installed apps are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and unfortunately, there's no way for us to query on state uh, because it's more expensive to use state um, to, to get this information. And because of this, this is exactly why uh, a subgraph is so interesting is with a subgraph, if we know an organization, if we know their kernel, and from their kernel, we know the ACL, the, the, the way I see a subgraph is it's essentially a big crawler for events. You like give it a start, you give it the start point of the maze, and then from that start point, you can start traversing all of the events, crawling through them, and marking contracts that you want to, uh, you want to care about, and you say, okay, this, this contract looks interesting from this event. Um, if we look at this diagram from the DAO factory onwards to the organization, uh, we see like, oh, if we start at the DAO factory, we go forward, we see this event. Well, this event contains the kernel and that gives us a link from, from the start of the maze, we have a path that gets us here. From the kernel, we have a bunch of other events that start getting emitted and these events are really useful uh, because they allow us to continue traversing the, the graph and creating paths as it may. And so we can kind of replace all of these events uh, with essentially a subgraph that will replicate this logic in some form um, and do this as the blocks are mined versus um, what we do right now, which is every time the front end gets loaded, we go talk to the node and tell them, hey, can you give us all of the relevant events from like forever ago to now and do that every single time this app opens. Uh, with the subgraph, we can do this in the back end 
and keep that in a database somewhere. So when we load a front end, we can just go and say, hey, I'm, I'm only interested in these parts of the graph. And this is an O of one operation now. I'm just saying, yeah, give me what you have currently. And that's what I'm going to go work with in terms of the permission state and the installed applications. Great. All right, so a bit of a tangent there. Um, anything that we should discuss a bit more or should I kind of continue onwards with the, the, the second class state? No, not me. Okay, Pierre, are you, uh, are you still here, still with us? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let me know if you have any questions. Um, I feel like I'm just continually just throwing things over and hopefully they make sense as concepts. Yeah, all good. They do. they do, they do. All right. Okay, so second class state. Let's talk about second class state here. We're, we're on here now. Um, run app. All right, so in terms of how the client is structured, we just described first class state, which was the ACL, um, the permission state, and then the list of installed applications. Now that's not the end of an organization, obviously. Otherwise you would see nothing in this organization. This organization here, Aragon Ones, it's composed of a whole bunch of different applications that extend its functionality. And we need state from all of those. Uh, voting, for example, has a bunch of votes that need to be reduced. And we haven't touched these at all. And when I talk about second class state, I'm really talking about these internal app states um, that we, that, you know, so I guess the way we can look at it is, is like first class apps and second class apps. Um, and that's kind of the, the way I've really started thinking about them. And the question for us in many ways as we go forward is, how much do we want to support second class apps and how easy do we want to make it uh, in terms of fetching information for second class apps um, and i don't call them second class because they're in any way less important in fact they're more important perhaps than the first class apps it's just there's a magnitude of difference or an in difficulty in obtaining the second class state uh, and that's why I have these two classes. First class, we can do really easily. It's like fairly obvious, even if we don't know exactly the path in terms of how we get the state onto a subgraph or onto a backend uh, rather than reducing events all the time. Second class is more difficult and again, by an order of magnitude, and it's not fully clear yet what the strategy should be. Uh, should we run our own backend caching server? Should we run effectively isolated subgraphs? Um, should we do something else entirely? Um, are they serviceable by simply ETH calls right now, uh, fetching against state? All of these questions are, are kind of up in the air, and that's why I have the second category of, of, of state that I think we probably don't need to worry about too much about and uh, focus first on getting the first class state right. So second class state is really um, handled by the client right now. Um, the client basically says, I'm gonna go run an app. So when we, when we go to the voting app, the client is saying, I'm gonna go run this voting app. And it does a bunch of things, but essentially it hooks up an entire uh, API layer with the applications. And the most important API layers are the ones that touch Ethereum for our context. So it's the contract helpers and it's the Web3 ETH and maybe there's a couple other ones, external contract helpers. What they do uh, is very similar to how the ACL works right now. When, a, when the client gets loaded and it starts uh, one of these applications, um, they they effectively do the same thing as the ACL. Uh, they go and they're like, okay, let me do a, uh, let me do a, a past events and current events for all of the blocks. So if we see um, init ACL, 
If we see this pattern, we see here that there is uh, past events and current events in the app API themselves, as we'll see. All right, so we're gonna see exactly the same thing. Current events, past events. When this gets loaded, they're going to do the same operation as the ACL. Again, going from, from here and fetching a set of blocks, looking for events, and then the current set of blocks for events. Um, they do all of this, and effectively all it comes down into is one operation here, if I can find it. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tap, cache, where is the reducer? Yeah, the wrap reducer. All right, so events with triggers, just imagine this, and imagine this as a stream of events. That, that's all it is. When this enters here, it's going to call this wrap reducer, and this is effectively the same thing as what we saw in this scan. We have an object that we're keeping uh, track of, and we're calling that the state, and then we have each new event. So if I were to um, Just copy this quickly. Hmm, that didn't work. Let me just quickly look at the box. And it is app locator. I think this should just work, right? The voting. Oh, yeah. Try to just set it to local. Yeah, just local. Yeah. If I do voting, it should probably just work, no? Yeah, it should, but if it, if it doesn't, you just try and set it to local. It should work as well. Sounds good. Um, where am I here? Initialize store next day. Okay. So if I just do a console log. I hope this will work. Let's see. Debugging actually. Uh, da, da, da. Hmm. Arguments is not. Um, why doesn't it? Why doesn't it show up? It's kind of weird. Filter by a reducer. Nice. Hmm. Well, that's funny. Calling arguments are not supported. I guess they're just not supported in um, lambdas.
All right, I think we're getting somewhere. Nice. All right, so we're not seeing too many here because we have the cash. Clear the application cash. We should see a whole bunch. Hopefully, ah, there we go. So now we're syncing and you'll see that what I'm doing here is effectively what's happening inside here. So all of the events are getting emitted. This is the event, the event, the event, etc. And then the second one is the state that we currently start at. So when we first start, we're starting with a very basic set. And then we start building state on top of this with each new event. You see that we have a new vote here and it didn't have votes before and we'll continue to see new votes uh, over time. If we jump down, you'll see there's quite a lot of events getting emitted and then you'll see at the, as we go further down, there's like a lot more votes and a lot more information uh, in each step. Um, and that's just Ethereum providing us events and we're doing some calls in that event. Uh, the interesting thing to note about this here is um, that we're... So, so the hard thing about this is that it's essentially event-driven. So if we think about it as, as this diagram, uh, every time a new block happens, if we have an event we care about, we're going to go trigger this reducer. And that reducer is going to is going to run this store function, this reducer. And then we have a bunch of event handlers that we see here, and that's going to provide some updates to state. Um, but the interesting thing is we're not only limited to event data here, what we allow for in these apps, in these reducers, is a bunch of ETH calls. And this is actually something that makes it a bit difficult to uh, for these to move entirely off chain in some sense, because they depend on the current data uh, that is at the head of the chain. So if we, if we look at it this way, if we only use events, it's fully deterministic, assuming we don't have none of the non-determinism bits that we were talking about. Uh, if we just rely on events, we'll get the events in the same order every time, and henceforth we can have a pure function that takes in these events, produces the same state as output at the end, regardless. Now, the problem with having the ability to use, uh, use ETH calls in these reducers right now is that states will differ based on when you do the ETH call. So let's say we're here at block four and we just got a bunch of new events and at this point we do uh, we check um, the state and so this looks good but if we add a block five at some point in the future and maybe a block six and a future time as well um, and our state gets updated to the point where it doesn't quite look the same we now start having problems. So let's say maybe somebody else changed the state on us, right? So the problem we have is things look very differently if you do an ETH call at this point of time, or if you do an ETH call at this point in time, even though there's no events. Uh, and we see this most clearly with token balances um, so, or at least it's the most simple example and most relevant, I guess. When, uh, so some applications are hooked up to tokens and they don't necessarily know what the token state will look like. Um, but if we look at this point in time, it'll look one way. Maybe the, the total supply will be 10 in the token. But then if another person uses the app at a different time and they look here, uh, the problem is that state is going to look different for them, they're gonna see like maybe 20 instead of 10. And there's no events that it's listening to, so it's quite hard for the front end or rather that script to be able to, 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 be able to know um, what new state is available because it's, it's completely driven by these events and there's no new events 
despite that state changing. Um, and so it's just kind of lost, right? Based on uh, when it was that it looked. Um, this particularly makes it really kind of difficult for us to move sec some of these uh, second class states um, into something like a subgraph because then we effectively have to start declaring all of their dependencies um, and building the subgraph can get quite large if we think about there being a large number of potential applications in the subgraph. Uh, and so, yeah, basically that's, that's a big blocker. Um, it's not clear right now what the strategies may be. Uh, there are definitely, I have a couple of thoughts in terms of ways that we can move this to be a backend server that effectively replicates the, the front end environment. And maybe just once in a while, um, we have like a polling function to have it rerun its reducer and do its ETH calls on every single block uh, and have it declare like a set of dependencies that it really cares about. Um, but that's kind of all in, on, in my head. And as I said, um, it's kind of like a 10x in difficulty compared to what we have with the first class, uh, the first class set of state. And, and particularly it's wide. I, I, I would like to not think about that problem until we uh, get more and more down the road and we have fixed the, the easy low hanging fruit first and then we can give extensions uh, of fetching the state to, to, uh, to people as they need it. Um, the nice thing I, with a lot of, sorry? No, no, uh, finish yours. Yeah, uh, the one thing I would say though is that the one nice thing about uh, most of the applications and the way that they've been written so far is that we have provided usually enough getters to be uh, fairly, um, we don't necessarily have to be event driven is, is what I'm trying to say. Um, for example, the voting app, uh, we collect all of these events. Well, sorry, we collect all of these votes through events and the ETH logs. But with the voting app, we actually expose getters that would also allow us to get all of the same information uh, once using the currently available state. Um, and most applications that I know of today um, have that capability where you can just go in and like do a bunch of ETH calls uh, to find out like all of the state. So you don't have to do the whole event fetching uh, over time. That's really expensive. Um, and for most integrations, I would say to prefer doing this for now as kind of a workaround. And then as this gets more and more complicated, um, we'll have to think about ways of moving that also to the back end. Um, or maybe they just write their own back end in that sense. Um, and they build their own database. But yeah, go on, Gabby. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that if I understood uh, correctly, this second uh, class state don't don't be more related to how people want to display it in their content as well. Yes, exactly. That is also true. Um, because yeah, this this second class like part of the ten x difficulty, or maybe this is making it a hundred times more difficult if we do ten times ten. Uh, <laughs> One of the tens is that they're fully generic, right? Um, we don't know what applications will get built. So we can't plan ahead in terms of saying, uh, yeah, like we know, we know exactly what's happening in this application. Um, it, rather, we need to expose a fairly generic set of APIs to allow people to like say, yeah, like my, my application cares about this and henceforth the state should be this. Uh, the second part that makes it another 10 times harder is um, uh, is that, yeah, we don't know what people want to use that state for. And in the general sense right now, um, the way it works is it's kind of similar to like having what, what, what would amount to a subgraph um, where we like give a fairly canonical representation of what this contract looks like on chain. Um, for example, voting, like if we look at the voting states, 
there's like not much to debate here. You have the settings and then you have the list of votes and you have in each vote whether or not it was executed and when it was started and all of these things. And it mirrors the on-chain state very well. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that other people will like this format or they'll find it either useful enough um, or like there's just other things they want to add to it or like other applications may not have such a non-debatable structure. Um, and this part kind of goes back to the genericness part. It's just like, we don't know both how data is going to get generated. And then secondly, who is going to use that data and how they like to use that data. Um, and so really that's why I think the, the second part here, the second class data, it's like such a hard problem versus this first class data, which is very much like non-debatable. We control them. We know what they look like and we can effectively create schemas that are like use this and you're going to be fine like everything you need is going to be here yeah yeah i agree on that yeah and um, yeah a much higher burden <laughs> yeah i mean we, we we do get to cheat a little bit because we effectively know like it's not as if we have a thousand apps and it's like oh shit, this is like really hard it's like we have like 10 to 15 apps and we can create special rules for all of them but yeah, <laughs> let's not let's not worry about that. Because <laughs> yeah. ideally, we would design something that could support thousands of apps in the future. Cool. All right, so I've I've talked quite a lot now. Um, the example reducer I, I kind of wanted to show was just this voting and how simple it is. Really, like how we see how we see this part. This is literally the reducer, completely event driven, uh, completely state. State just gets carried over, an event gets run. You know how to handle that logic. Very much like Redux, um, if people are familiar with that from the front end world. Um, the action is kind of the event, the state is kind of the store. You just apply transforms on top of it, continual transforms, uh, very much actually like a blockchain. And the things that are possible, you get the event and you're also able to do Web2 API calls as well as uh, Web3 ETH call or other random Web3 calls like getting block numbers and block state and things like that um, in, in this reducer. Um, the main point being about those last two that it isn't completely uh, identpotent, I think is the way you pronounce that. You, you can't completely build, or rather we can't completely assume that applications will have their uh, states be built using just events. Um, most likely they would want to do other things on top, whether that's uh, doing ETH calls for simple balance checks or otherwise, um, or calling Web2 APIs to check on prices or do whatever, who knows. Uh, but all of that kind of extension is there and that has been that has made it particularly also difficult um, to design around because we, again, it's not just a pure function. It has a bunch of other ex extended, like dirty, I guess we can call them, uh, APIs that will feed back. And, um, and yeah, <laughs> just makes it harder. Okay. Um, Caching strategy, I just wanted to talk really briefly about. Uh, I know we're getting quite into this. Um, the reason why I talked about non-determinism and about block reorgs is particularly about caching strategy. And I don't quite know how the graph handles this and it might be something we wanna check into. Um, but you see here, we, we have something called the block reorg margin. And we apply this in both the ACL as well as the second class app state because they're very similar. If we look at what this is defined as, it's 100. So the reason why we chose this was completely arbitrary, but we do this dance, this two-step dance. We first say, get me all the past events and then get me the current events. And this is true for, again, both the ACL and the second class state. Uh, why we do this. So if we look at this diagram, effectively the way I like to call this is committing. 
So let's use this, this line as our commit line. Um, or rather, we can also call it finalization line. Block two, if we say we're getting uh, past events from one, block one and two, we're effectively declaring block two finalized. And block three and four are things that may potentially have reorgs or non-deterministic stuff happen to them. And the way that this works in Aragon.js is on the plat at the end of the past events. So once we're done looking at uh, block two, for example, we cache the results up to there and we store that in a database somewhere basically. And so at this point, this information is stored for future use and everything ahead of it, block three and four, we assume may disappear in the future and we'll have to refetch because we don't know for sure that they're not going to change. And so applied to this, uh, if we write this out a bit further, we could have like block one, block two, block three. Let's say for the sake of example, this is block five. We're effectively creating a commit line here and saying everything up to here, finalized, we're good. Everything after here, uh, we may have some interesting stuff happen and we're not sure what's going to happen. So don't trust it entirely. Um, we can be optimistic and show the user a new state, but if they reload or they uh, come back to the app, we're just going to go ignore this part. Um, and in the future, this will just get finalized, hopefully, and we'll be able to move this commit line forward. And if you know this happens, we would be able to move this commit line forward to Jesus, this is hard to drag um, to here and then say any blocks after this point are also non finalized. And we just will show state, but we won't we won't catch them and we won't save them for later. Um, as for why we chose 100. Tough question. Um, most most block confirmations uh, you'll see with exchanges are about 30. Um, the reason we do this is there's effectively a percentage chance every time you mine a block um, on top of another block that decreases the chance that the previous one will change. Uh, and so with 100, we felt that 100 times 0 point, like once, uh, just called 0 0.5, it was like about 20 to 25 minutes worth of confirmations. And like that should definitely be guaranteed um, finalization in terms of Ethereum right now. Uh, and you know that's like what is thirty times uh, divided by four seven point five. It's about like three to four times better than most exchanges are doing. Um, and so we said, yeah, that's fine. Like fetching the past hundred blocks, not very expensive um, compared to like fetching millions of blocks. So yeah, that's why we have this little interesting dance here. Um, okay, before we move finally to the last topic about transaction pathing, anything on the above, uh, because transaction pathing will touch a whole bunch of the things that we talked about. <laughs> nope. All nope. right. Okay, so transaction pathing, lovely subject. The um, I'm going to restart Aragon.js so I can run it against Rinkaby. Okay, good. Let me just restart this. And I'm going to have to change this. Okay. So, where are we here? This is the wrapper. All right, so further down the line in this giant file, at around uh, line 1,200 or so, I think, we start to get to transaction pathing. Now, uh, as I mentioned previously, there's kind of like two or three different types of transaction pathing. Actually, there's four. I think I listed four here. Direct, normal, final, intent basket. 
So direct is the easiest. Direct is what happens when we go to voting and we create a new vote. So let me make sure I'm on the same network here and we are on that. Just ignore all of this. Okay, hope this works. All right. So when we do this new vote, this new vote, it's not protected by any permissions. Oh, sorry, it is. I lied. Actually, it is. But for most people, actually, no, that's wrong. What am I saying? Um, let me create a vote. It's a, it's a different thing. So, ah, shit, what happened? Do I not have any tokens? Oh, I need to connect. Okay, so I create the vote. Uh, this actually did transaction pathing in the background, but let's wait for it to show up. All right, shit, I have too many tokens. Who has tokens? Eww, crap, do I have these accounts? Probably don't actually. Hmm. Well, let me let me do a couple things quickly. Um, tokens F ah nice. So I can do this directly. And who is this? Let me assign a different person. Let me just make it any entity. Let's do that. All right, so da -da -da -da. When this finalizes, all right, perfect. So we'll just wait for this to mine. Oh, perfect. Okay, so we have this new test, vote number 77. Now, if we look at these actions, yes and no, vote. These are the ones that do not have any permissions associated with them. It says I can directly perform this. Yes, I'm going to do this. If we look in the code, So if we look here, if we look at vote, there's no auth parameter, right? So new vote has this auth label, vote does not have an auth. This means it's unpermission. Anybody can call it, assuming that they meet the desired criteria, which is they have tokens. And so you can see I have a direct uh, transaction. Uh, so this is not really pathing, this is just calling a transaction. But we can look into the code perform transaction path, and we will see here where is it? This one transactions at next. Get okay, transaction path. Okay, it should be here. Nope. Okay. So if I do this, if I try to do any action, it's going to go through get transaction path uh, because I don't know at this point whether or not it's direct or not. 
uh, I'm going to go enter through here to figure out whether or not it is. Now I'm going to go calculate this transaction path. And this is where the fun really, really gets to start. So, I can't hide this. Interesting. So, from here on, right, sender is going to be my account. I'm going to use that because I need to know who it is that we're packing from. Uh, if we go back to the blog post, EVM, if we go back here and we see here, uh, right, so we need to know the end user because this person ultimately is the one who kicks off the transaction path and that's going to be the sender. Now, the destination, the destination is the target. In this case, it's only one. It's AB85. This is going to be the voting app. Uh, I can almost guarantee it. We will open another instance. Right, so that's AB85, and that's our voting app. Now, uh, there's a bunch of checks, a bunch of things happen, these don't really matter. The methods, these are important. So this is from the artifact.json, and we can see in the methods that we have essentially the equivalent of kind of the ABI. This is the, I guess, human readable ABI. And we also have the roles and as well a rat spec string for what this is actually going to do. Now, if we look at vote, this is the one, no roles, and it gives me this string. So I'm gonna go through, so yes, I have methods. Uh, yes, I have the full method signature, et cetera, et cetera. I found the method inside, the one that I wanna call, the method signature that I have here, and the parameters. So if we looked at these, params, it's going to be vote on number 77, I'm going to be voting true, yes, and yes. Uh, this, this is voting yes or no, and this is yet voting on whether or not, or sorry, this last parameter is whether or not I'm going to execute this vote. Method signature is just vote, okay, so that's going to go find me the vote signature that we saw up here, and final forwarder is not used. And we'll talk about the final forwarder when we get to the ACL. So what do we have? Final forwarder provided, false, direct transaction. So we create a direct transaction to do the final step. So the way this algorithm works, uh, and I wanted to draw a diagram, but maybe I can start drawing one. Uh, as we go, oops. Oh shit, I only have two free boards. Really? You're gonna make me pay soon. Alright, so user and we're gonna have bear with me. Alright, so we're gonna have we're gonna have this chain here. And the thing we wanna do is vote. Right, so that, that's what we want to do. Let me just color this the same way as a transaction. There we go. So, user target. Right, so th that's kind of what we're trying to do here. And now, if I go into this, uh, we're going to go look and we're going to see, okay, are there any roles? If there's no roles, then it sounds like we don't have any permissions and we can just directly invoke this. Once we get to apply transaction gas, that means we found the path and all we're doing at this point is just uh, providing a bit more metadata in terms of how much gas this transaction will use and just lifting it up to the signer. So here we're gonna say yes, that is the case. No method roles, no final forwarder provided, no funky stuff going on. And of course, there's no final provider, so this part I can ignore. This is just about looking whether or not I'm the final forwarder. So, all good. Um, that's direct. That's as yep. simple as it gets. Yep, Gabby? No, no, no I was saying yes. 
Yeah. Okay. So with this, uh, let me see if I can go up a level and we have the path. And you'll see very simple path, one transaction. I got an estimate for the gas. I have an estimate for the gas price. And you're gonna see that's kind of this button is gonna send that transaction. This string we were getting from here, vote supports yes or no in vote ID this, that's where that's coming from. Now, that's the easy path. Now we can get into, quick. yep. What we've seen is the, the destination is always uh, up in the organization. It does not have to be. Okay. So that is, uh, let's call that external. Yeah, so we have another thing there where we can call an external contract if we want to. And that should apply the same. Should, should have the out, the method implemented, or is not that uh, a requirement? Yes, so if we look at specifically external, we will get here. Yeah, so you'll see, um, yeah, external, we have an option when we try to perform the transaction path. And it means whether or not it's against the currently running application or if it's a totally separate uh, contract. By currently running application, we're talking about the voting app in this case, the one that's open. Now, how this comes about, and there's kind of two ways that this works. So if we get the get external transaction path, um, first we check, is this an ACL proxy? Um, because, yeah, so there's like two layers of external, I guess. There is, let me just document that, there's, internal but not currently running application and then there's uh, arbitrary contract outside organization there's these two cases case one is internal to the organization but it's not the currently running application and that can either be the acl or one of the installed apps if this happens we just kind of treat it like uh, the same as other ones, um, it just provides us a little bit more of a front end um, flag to tell, yeah, you're not like, it'd be weird if voting told you to go mint tokens, for example, right? So we're just telling you, um, hey, this looks like it's yeah, invoking an action not on the voting app, but actually the transaction or the, the token manager app. And that may seem funky, you should be aware of that. Uh, the other part is this final part. So it's not an installed app on this organization. And when we get this, we're just going to create a direct transaction um, from the current user, because uh, we don't know anything about this direct transaction or this direct, um, uh, yeah, this, this external contract. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this bit may get interesting because with the agent, effectively, we yeah, would most likely want to add on top of this, but we haven't done that in any way. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so back towards normal transaction pathing. We can see a normal transaction path when I create a vote because what you'll see if I turn off the debugger is, damn it, I have it set to anyone. Uh, let me just undo this quickly. So, if I delete this, ah, okay, well this happens too. Um, this is what it looks like when there's a transaction path. This is actually for the ACL though, so it's a bit more complicated. And we'll talk about the final forwarder when we get back to this. Oh, that was fast. This is the, the, which one the, of the four or five now <laughs> kind of pathing? Yes. So uh, there's this concept that we call the final forwarder for lack of a better name. Um, it is only really useful today 
uh, for outside contracts and the ACL. Um, and I, I kind of want to ignore the outside contracts, but for the ACL, we'll, we'll get into that after normal transaction path in because it kind of just yeah. adds a bit of a tweak to it. Yeah, okay. I, I was wondering about the which one are you uh, going through now of the other of all the. Yeah, so different... yeah, let me just title this. So where am I here? So I'm talking about normal pathing. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry. And so, yeah, we'll see this. I sh we should see this now. Okay, I can, I can still do this. Uh, I need to delete another permission. Delete myself. Gonna wait for a couple of seconds. Nice. Okay, should work now. All right. So you'll see here if I try to create a vote now, uh, it's gonna tell me I can't do this. Sorry, buddy, you can't do this. You have to first go through the tokens. And how does it detect this? Or better yet, let's look at finance. Let's say I'm some malicious guy and I'm like, oh man, there's a lot of BCC, like this is great. Actually, I should turn my, let me just turn off the ad block. That's all turned off. Let me just refresh this so I can get the logo. It's really, really important to get the BCC logo sometimes. <laughs> brings, brings your entire day up. Okay, well, it doesn't want to load. It must not exist anymore, <laughs> you guys. Anyhow, um, I'm gonna go get some BCC in that, and I'm, you know, I'm just some dude on the internet, and I'm like, oh, this is a cool org. I want some BCC. I'm gonna go take one of these. Right. Uh, I need to connect first of all. That's that's important. And now, why does it not let me do this? Ah, I'm depositing. Sorry, I'm with, I'm withdrawing. I'd like to withdraw to my account. So, BCC, I'm gonna go take one. I'm gonna be like, all right, I, want, I want some BitConnect. All right, so I'm gonna go submit this withdrawal. It's gonna do some work, hopefully. Let's take a while. And, hmm, hmm. Sometimes it can take a while. Maybe let's try a different token for more. You mean the wrapper, the one? <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling it. Just doesn't, doesn't want me to get it. Don't know why. I'm doing local host. What? Oh, this is the, the port. Never mind. <clears throat> there, this one. Where are my friends? That's a shame, really? This should work. Let me let me check on rank and beer. Yeah, it works there. Okay, maybe I just need a refresh. Maybe something broke uh, from all the moving around. Um Good trick as well, by the way, if you look at the WebSocket frames, we were talking about um, the, the ETH logs. One thing I do a lot is I look at, I, I look at this a lot. And you can just tell, so this is the, this is going up to the node, 
and the arrows will come down. So if I do ID 4, or maybe ID 79, if I do 79, you'll see that it takes us a while to, yeah, it takes us a while to get here. Um, time, it takes us about a second to do this, but if this was not Rinky B and Mainnet and we weren't cheating with Infura, you will see this lag quite, quite prominently. Um, and through this as well, you can see, you can basically see the entire way we're, oper we're interacting with the JSON RPC. You can see a bunch of ETH calls that are happening and what's happening with them. And then also all the, uh, again, all the ETH get logs. You can see that we have the from block, the two block, this is a past transaction, past logs. Uh, this is probably the ACL or something, or maybe this is one of the apps. Um, it's probably one of the apps actually. But anyway, this WebSocket frame debugger is one of the nicest bits of using Chrome. Uh, so let me see if well, I can get this to work. <laughs> Makes sense. All right, it works. Okay, so let me just, shouldn't have closed that so quickly. All right, so we have this. I'm getting my BCC and it's gonna be like, well, no, you can't do this, buddy. So you need to first go through two steps. First of all, you need to have a token, right? You have to be a token holder. And then second of all, you need to be a voting. Uh, you need to go through a vote to, to do this. And if I do this, if I create the transaction, it will create a vote um, when the transaction gets mined and we'll see that I wanna, transfer one BCC to myself. Um, we can see this afterwards. So how does this work? Yeah, how do we, how do we go from, how do we go from, this set of contracts into something that is ordered like we just saw and let me just draw this uh, actually let me put this back here so now what I need to do is as a user I would like to do something on finance and I'm going to uh, I'm gonna go do transfer that's that's what I'm gonna do Right, so we're going to come back to this diagram quite a lot. Let's try that and put on the debugger. All right, so same as before, we're going to get to get output transaction path. We're going to get here. Uh, if we want to look at the values, sender is me, destination is now the finance app. The method signature is a new immediate payment and params are going to be, uh, this is, what is this? Let me check. Let's see, well, I'll find it soon. So address address, new immediate payment to receiver for reference. Ah, yes. So. One of these is the token. This first one is the token. This is the BitConnect token. This is the, the two address, so meme. This is the amount, and this is the reference string that we're pushing into uh, this call. So same as before, I have all of these, all the checks pass. Again, no final, no final forwarder provided. This is false, and I'm gonna go create the direct transaction. So this transaction right now, what this object means is uh, from, to, and data, right? All of this, this has been encoded assuming that this link is direct, like before. It's effectively made this link. And it's just like, yeah, if, if this was possible, this is the transaction you would send. Now, the, the thing that differs from before is if we look at method, it's, new immediate payment, but it has a role. This is important, right? This this role is important. And this role, if I go 
here new immediate payment you'll see that I have this auth stream so this means I have permission set up on the immediate payment and it lines up with here that means all right time to check permissions um, it's definitely not going to be direct so we're gonna have to do some fancy things to go find the path so first of all we're gonna go find the list of forwarders the list of forwarders in this application map to these two addresses uh, one of which is tokens one of which is voting we'll just double check voting is a b85 so this is voting this is tokens um, Larger organizations, for example, Beehive, you might see a whole bunch of them. And then this operation, of course, gets much more expensive. Uh, we're going to check the final forwarder. This doesn't apply yet. We'll talk about that afterwards. And now we get into the permissions. So now we have the list of permissions and we're going to do our local quick heuristic tests, right? So this is all the permissions set up. Uh, we're going to go look for the destination and we're going to see who has permissions to do this. So if we look at destination permissions, for each of these roles, there's a set of allowed entities. Uh, if I look quickly here on the finance app, I do not get to see the role, I think. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Anyhow, um, one of these will be the role. Let me just see if I have the method dot roles. Okay, well, we'll figure it out. Role sig. So 5DE4. 5DE4 is this one. So allowed entities is this address, which is the voting address. So now I'm going to check. Okay, do I, do I have any allowed entities? If there are no allowed entities, literally this is a hard stop. Like, I, there's no way I can, I can do this. There, there's no way the user has permission. Uh, so I just end and like, that's that. We just give them a big error saying, you can't do this, sorry. But if we go on from there, because in this case, we do have one, we have the voting app, we start going further. Uh, so if one of these is the sender is me, that means I have direct access to it. And that means we can go directly to sending that transaction. In this case, we do not and false. Uh, so one second. Uh, mm -hmm. when, when you, you say, say that, uh, there, uh, you can be an allow entity. Wouldn't that be a ready check before when we try to do a direct transaction? Or you also uh, need to tra traverse the, the at least part of the path uh, because the, there is a role and this uh, was not checked yet. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of this, do you mean like we could have done this check up here instead of yeah. waiting further? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Or, or you can also repeat the question. Yeah. I, because in the previous example, we did the transaction directly. And I wonder if, if we, if we know that the allow entity was us, couldn't we go the same way that before? Or I'm, yes. Or. Yep. Okay. No. Yep. Maybe I overcomplicated it. <laughs> no, no, all good. Okay. Let me just show you what I mean. Um, let me add the permission back for myself. Yeah, so if I assign myself again, voting, custom address myself and create new votes um actually no i don't want to do this i'm gonna go do something else i'm gonna go to tokens and allow myself oh i might already be able to do this perfect 
So in the tokens app, this is a slightly different example, but um, let's go add tokens for myself. I'm going to get myself yep. to eight. Right. So if I do this, I should have the permissions to do so, right? So if I, oh, oops. Right. So going down through this, we already kind of know that this is going to exist. So here we're, we're at the same point as before, right? So method dot roles, a role exists. That means we, yep. we have to check permissions. So if we go forward, we have a list of forwarders, list of forwarders, and final providers not provided. Now we get into checking permissions. So what do we see? Yep. We see that allowed entities are these two, both voting and myself these two addresses. So that check is passed. There is all these people, but now this, this will pass, right? So this line of code is, oh, Yeah, so we're at this line of code. So the user may have permission and if so, we should do the direct transaction. Uh, okay. So we have, yeah, we check the address, whether that's myself or any entity. And in this case, this first check will be true. And that sounds good. So we're gonna go into this and this will actually check when we do the apply transaction gas, when we do this, and we get the estimated gas limit, um, you'll, you'll kind of see some notes here, right? At the same time, this is a hack for checking if the call will revert. When we do the estimate gas, this will actually tell us whether or not this direct transaction is possible. Uh, and if we go down here, it says, yes, I got a gas limit back. That means I can probably do this and if this erred, it would mean that even though on the permissions, if it looks like I can I can do this, I can't do this. Uh, th again, this will throw. Um, so for okay. here, uh, again, direct transaction, I have permission and it tells me I can directly do this. Right. Now, if we go back to withdrawing, And we have everything set up. I'm just gonna jump now. So we were here before. We know that there's allowed entities. And if we keep going forward, great. I'm not one of the, uh, I'm not directly one of the entities and it's not any entity. So it looks like we had to do full transaction pathing. What we're gonna do first of all, is we're gonna go calculate the forwarders with permission. Uh, we're gonna go take their list of forwarders and we're gonna see which one of those have permissions to, or look like they have permissions uh, to interact with the, the action, with, with the target. The reason why, the reason why we say uh, it looks like, or they may have permission, is because just from the on-chain state, it's really hard for us to tell definitively whether or not. So all we're doing at this point is we're saying, this definitely cannot happen. That definitely cannot happen. This guy definitely doesn't have permission. But on the flip side, then we're saying, okay, this is we've reduced our set of possible uh, people to just these few few entities, whether that's like an app or a person or et cetera. Um, the, re the reason why we, we don't know this definitively is because uh, the permissions module is complex and can include a lot of logic that is hidden from us. Um, so we never actually know for sure whether or not something is possible until we've tried it with an ETH call or the person has actually sent the transaction. Um, sometimes even the ETH calls is a false ne negative. Um, so it's a bit of a shame. Uh, but anyway, so we're here. Are you, mm -hmm. uh, no, maybe to uh, to 
uh, deep of a concept, but explain a bit why is that? That is not possible to to see the that many information of the permissions at that point. Yeah. So, for example, take the token Oracle in Dandelion. Yeah. That is a permission Oracle uh, or an ACL Oracle. And we only, from the front end, we only know that that exists. That's as far as we can tell. I mean, we can go further, but it's, it's really hard to go further. It's like a 10x problem again uh, to, to go further. So when we look at that permission, we know, okay, this permission looks like it's clean. It's like just a binary yes or no, or it may have additional parameters. If it has these additional parameters, uh, it gets really hard for us to um, to definitively say whether or not this permission is going to be true at the time until we actually try it. Okay. Is it's related that... also with the param parameters uh, being more complex to evaluate at, at, uh, without uh, getting all the data? Exactly. The so with the parameters, we would have to evaluate the parameters and evaluate them against their current on-chain state to definitively know. And like once we do that, we've effectively already done an ETH call anyway, and like it's expensive. So what we're doing here is we're just saying like, okay, this guy doesn't have permissions. There's no way he's going to be able to call this. Uh, ignore him and start building out the list that is possible. Perfect. Uh, so if we look at forwarders, we have two forwarders, again, tokens and voting. Now, if we look at what we get after this, we're going to see forwarders with permission. And we only see the voting app, which is interesting, right? So we started this process. If we look at this code, we started this process with the full forwarders array. And now we're like, okay, so we know the permissions on the target and the permissions just say these people are allowed and let's go filter these and say, okay, between the forwarders that are possible, uh, which ones look like they have permission. And in our case, we've reduced the list from two down to one. And if we want to draw this out a little bit, um, effectively, it's like we have this. And these are the possible apps. And now, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna go with tokens and voting. And then we're gonna have a, let's do that. We're going to do a set of permissions. Uh, let's call it payment raw. And well, we can like manage raw. Let's just call it manage raw. Um, and we can say, yeah, the people who have payment raw only voting. And the people who are maybe not managed, maybe it's like manage is too broad a term. Um, maybe. I know finance is pretty simple. Um, let's call it update. There's like one to do payments and one to update some information. And that's like, that's some root account. Some, some random person with a root account. Um, so let's say these are the permissions, right? So when we look at this, we have the possible forwarders right now. And we have these two, and then we have these, these permissions. So we're trying to do something that needs the payment role. And so we need the voting. Uh, like we know that only voting is is the one that's that's useful here, and so with that we we look at our list and we're like, okay, well tokens clearly doesn't have permission, so only voting is possible. So that probably means that voting is going to come into the next step, but we don't know, right? 
if we, for example, uh, extended this in, uh, infrastructure a little bit, let's call it, um, uh, let's say there's an agent installed as well, and voting becomes, let's say there's two that can do payments. At this point, we don't know, right? We, we don't have we don't have more than, or we don't we're not only left with one, so we can just effectively remove agent. And at this point, we're like, oh well, we have two possible forwarders. That's uh, that's that's difficult. We don't know what to do, so we have to keep going forward and checking their paths uh, to see if we can find one from either of them uh, forward. Um, so that's where this function calculate forwarding path gets into. You'll see the arguments here, sender, destination, same as before, direct transaction. This is what would happen. This is the target action. Uh, and then the forwarders with permission. And the forwarders for, with permission, again, are, are, this, are this set. Uh, yeah, first thing, if there's no forwarders with permissions, we're done. Nobody can do this. Uh, but we can go forward. And this is where it kind of gets fun. So, right. Um, just looking at this again. Okay, so when we're at the first uh, layer, um, this is a bit of an optimization slash, uh, I'm, I'm gonna call it an optimization because um, it's a little bit redundant, but it is in effect an optimization. Uh, because our paths are fairly short right now, um, this, this works well. So the first thing we do is we go through each of these forwarders. So right now we have these two, right? So this next step, what we're effectively doing is saying, well, we don't know how this is gonna be possible, but we know one of these two may be possible. So I'm gonna go change this guy over here and go duplicate that and go change him to be over here. And right. So now we have question marks. Let me just change this to be a question mark, to be a question mark. All right, so I'm like, these are possible. Maybe we're gonna find paths through these. Maybe we won't, we'll see. And then this next step, uh, it's effectively just testing this. Can I directly as a user use one of these two uh, to talk to the target? Is this a single one hop transaction path? And we can see this with a can forward here and then with the apply forwarding fee and the apply transaction gas. So yeah, we loop through and we're like, you and you, I'm gonna go try you with the user. First, I'm gonna try the forwarding path here. And well, maybe it would have been better to do the other way. Let's see. Um, but let's pretend that like we try the forwarding path and it's like, oh, this does, this also doesn't work. There's no forwarding path, direct forwarding path from the user to the voting. Uh, that probably means the user wasn't able to create a vote directly on the voting app. Okay, so we try the next one. Then we try tokens. Right, so, so here we try again. Does the user, do, do they have tokens? And then can they use the final uh, the, the, and then can tokens uh, invoke the final um, action. Pretend in this case that the user doesn't have tokens either, can't do it. Or he doesn't have tokens yet, I don't know. It's kind of contrived because we'll have to use this again in the future. But let's say this fails, right? So in both of these cases, that's what's going to happen here. Uh, in this case, our forwarder is only going to be the voting app and we're gonna go forward and we're gonna say, you know, can I directly, as the sender, and to the forwarder, can I directly forward to them? And it's gonna be a no. And it jumped back because it was a no, otherwise we would have continued forward. And in this case, we've exhausted our options for a one hop 
So we're gonna do the more complex step. And so if we come back here, we're like, well, shoot, like we can't do either of these. So we're gonna have to really work to, to find a path. And now we essentially, you can kind of read some of the documentation here uh, effectively in how this works. Um, but what we end up doing is we start doing a breadth first search in, in terms of finding a path. So we just tried the direct path. We know that didn't work. So now we're like, well, what's left, right? What, what's left? For both of these, it sounds like, uh, if I can do this, if I'm, it sounds like this guy's next. And for this guy, it sounds like this guy's next. But again, this is a bit contrived because we only had two. What if we had three? Right, and let's call this like app x. Now, now it's a bit more complicated, right? We're like, which one do we try first? And different algorithms will have different properties, but we chose a breadth first search. And so we went to tokens and we're like, well, it could be the set of these two. Like effectively, we don't know. And what we will do is, uh, is like, we're gonna have to try both eventually. Right? That, that's just gonna be reality. I don't know why this isn't working. Um, but also for the tokens, we're also gonna have to try both. We're gonna have to try both of the ones that are left. And then for AppX, we're gonna need both of these. And, and so let me just draw the lines quickly here. Okay, so at this step, right, we've, we've now made, like, uh, if we, it's address, what is the permission for there? Okay. Okay, well, again, this is a bit contrived because um, there's only one example. But effectively, we, we looked at it and we were like, well, we can't use uh, these two directly. Actually, oh wait, maybe, maybe this will work. Let me see what the queue looks like. Yeah, there's an array of two. So, um, hmm, this has already added it on top, okay. Yeah, so we kickstart the, the breadth first search algorithm and we're like, you know, this is all the possible things that we could try. And we're starting to, you know, we're starting to get a complicated graph here. We're like, well, if this doesn't work, then we try that, then we try that, then we try that, then we try that. And that one, if this doesn't work, then we have like another layer of contracts effectively where like we just don't know what to do and we just keep trying things until we build some sort of path forward and that's effectively all that this is is doing um, so what what this just did for the queue is it realized these two are possible for the queue and it's going to say okay i'm going to try this one first this one didn't look like it worked so i'm going to go try this one right and then if these don't work, then we go to the next, to the next, to the next. Uh, and you know, as I just showed, we can duplicate this onto a different layer and then it just gets more and more painful. Um, if we see this here, right, we can see the from in the path. Uh, the queue is effectively right now we have going to, I think this is voting and then, fin and then finance. Um, and so, it's going to get this Quick first question. one. Yep. Uh, how are the order of the queue is uh, decided? Totally random. Okay. Uh, just, just like whatever we have, the order that we have things in. Like install, install it or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mostly just install. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it depends on how information gets serialized back into memory. 
Um, but like it's just effectively the order that the objects are, the keys are added to the object. Um, and then the way that we pull them out, it, it, it more or less keeps that, that same order. Uh, so we'll take a look at some of these variables. The path is going to be, again, what I said. Uh, the last one, um, we, we kind of have two. So here we can see it's from me, but it's going to voting. And then the next one, the two, is actually finance. So we've tried to build out this, this path here, that linkage. And now we're going to go look forward and the forwarder. This is tokens, so we've now built this path. And if we keep going, uh, da, 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 we just do a bunch of encoding, and then we now start doing the can forwards. And the can forwards are really testing um, this link. So each of these ones here at this point are now doing another check, effectively the same as here. It's saying, uh, the current forwarder, so the previous forwarder, this address is the voting, and now this one, this forwarder, is the token. This is this is where where you, we are checking what what you mentioned about actually having the permissions in on chain. Uh, kind of, kind of. Um, e yes, yeah. So actually, yes, that's true because can forward is doing an ETH call. So, in fact, this will tell us for sure whether or not, or 90%, I'd say, <laughs> depending on mm -hmm. the permissions. But this will tell us, uh, yes, if we were to send this transaction directly from him to him, uh, or him to him, the, the backwards, um, it should work. The forwarding should work. And yes, yeah, this is, uh, this is the ETH call. So here we should pass, I think. And so that says, yes, the tokens, the current forwarder that we're on, again, we're up here. The user is trying this one. Tokens, this link, we're testing this link into voting. Yes, it did work. Now the next one is, yeah, testing this link. So that one again, can forward this link, this next one that we do, with the next can forward is testing between the sender and the tokens. And indeed with that one, it also works. And so now we have a full path. We tested this and it looked good. So now we're just left with, with that, that path, the, the three of these. And from there on, we just go forward and say, yes, like all the same as before, we're gonna for sure try this and now when we apply the transaction gas, we're going to um, again double check that this will this linkage works. Um, now again, this is a bit contrived because we didn't see the failure case. But had we reversed the order a little bit, um, then we would have seen uh, we would have seen this happen instead. We would have seen yeah, this happen instead. We would have tried voting against tokens and voting doesn't have any tokens right now, so it can't happen and this would have failed. We would have backed off on the queue and then we would have went back to here um, to try this one. Uh, and I, mm -hmm. There is a, this, this algorithm is also uh, the, uh, stopping as soon as you find a path or try to also get uh, several paths that are possible at this point. It only, it stops at the first path. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting because if, because if we are able to reorg the apps in a way that the most likely way of using it, it might be more fast. Okay. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, okay. definitely with the permissions, um, we will probably uh, I mean, so the thing is right now, I think once it gets to this step, uh, we, we more or less throw away the permissions. We're just like, I, I don't know what's going to happen. We're just going to try everything. Um, but here as well, we should probably also think about the permissions. Um, and rather than using the ETH call for the can forward, uh, we can do that off of 
the information we know from from the events uh, from the from the ACL and build this path completely without doing any calls to network and then just like test um, yeah uh, test whether or not the paths actually worked um, the thing the difficulty right. thing right now or the difficult thing right now with having more paths is it's kind of unbound uh, because if you think about it it's like okay we found this one now what do we exhaust every other option which like becomes larger and larger based on the number of apps we have installed uh, maybe yeah, yeah. but like <laughs> that that really should like at that point we really need to do um, the the the, the heuristics with the permissions um, so we don't have to yeah. go to network every time because that's really slow. Uh, you'll see sometimes that it just, the transaction, the side panel, it won't open because it's continually doing this in the background. Yeah, uh, I see it, that's happened. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of annoying, isn't it? Yeah, um, no, but even, yeah, it's, there, there could be a lot of apps that become much more difficult. Yeah, yeah, it only gets harder, right? So Beehive, you can imagine this was a contrived three app example, but Beehive has what, like seven or eight apps? And uh, I don't know how many forwarders there are, maybe there's four or five, but adding yeah. one forward, right? It's like, um, it, it's yeah, definitely yeah. not linear. <laughs> yeah, no linear. <laughs> okay, uh, anyhow, so now we're at the end here. So we found a transaction that we could send and if I now play this, indeed, it was able to do so, and I can see this path. It goes from voting, sorry, tokens to voting, and if I create this, it's going to go through both. Um, so that was the normal path, uh, as I call it. Um, yeah. Any any questions, uh, or should we continue going forward? The heart of the algorithm itself, again, breadth for search, is very just simple algorithm, uh, graph algorithm. So not complicated here. Our implementation gets a little bit awkward in some sense, um, but that's that's what it's doing. Uh, you can tell by the queue effectively as well. Uh, when you use a queue, you do a breadth first search. Yeah, yeah right. Yep. Okay. All right, we're getting we're getting towards the end. So two final topics here. Um, final forwarded path in. So this is a concept that is primarily useful for the ACL slash permissions app. Um, the reason why permissions requires this is because there are permission actions on on the ACL, but those are not exposed via roles. Uh, and this was a bit of a lack maybe of, of foresight, but also the ACL controlling itself via permissions is very meta and I don't know what that would mean. So we kind of needed a back door here um, with permissions to say like, who is a manager? Um, so if we go and we look at a application, let's say finance, change period duration, not assigned yet. Now, if we create this permission, it's going to ask you for a manager. And this manager is the one who has permission uh, to grant and revoke these, uh, these permissions. Uh, and if we see, for example, create new payments, it's managed by voting. So only voting can create or revoke new permissions. And, uh, and again, this doesn't work with what we had previously because if you see the, the role check here, well, changing permissions in the ACL, if I do a grant permission, there is no auth, right? And this is what I mean by meta because the ACL doing an auth on itself would just get very meta and it would just go in endless circles. Um, so we need a backdoor and the way we had this was only permission manager. So permission manager, again, correlates here. What, mm -hmm. what do you mean by a backdoor in that case? Uh, a backdoor in terms of like getting out of the auth system. Uh, because oh. like imagine if we, if we did an auth role here, right? If we did like... So if we did this, 
this would be very awkward because it's effectively asking the ACL itself, like, hey, do you have permission um, yeah. to do this? And then it's going to go and be like, well, I don't know. Let me ask myself if I have permission. And then it's going to go ask itself again and again and again. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So we got out of this by just saying, okay, there's just like simple. There's just only owner for this permission and it's called the manager. Uh, now, unfortunately, this means a lot of the tooling doesn't work, right? So the roles doesn't exist. So if we see here, um, if I change this, if I try to create this permission, let me give it to any account, it's fine. Um, I'll make myself the owner, All right? So we're, we're gonna go through here. We're gonna go find the app, indeed. The app is here. We find the ACL. We're gonna find the methods. What method are we calling? Create permission, params. It's gonna be any account, uh, the address, uh, the manager, and the role bytes. If we go down, we're gonna go through, find the direct transaction, but not here, right? This is the difficult part. Method.roles, what is method? Method is create signature, has roles. Oh shit, this one does have a role. Okay, this one's fine. Need a different one, for example. Um, grant, right, so let me assign a permission to myself. Um, let me give it to any account. Create new roles. So the thing I messed up on was uh, create permission does have an auth role. Um, and in fact, you know, this works because it's kind of like, I guess it's outside, perhaps it's like kickstarting the permission process, but when we're doing grants, um, like now this is becoming internal to the permissions app. And this is where it gets awkward to ask itself, do I have permission or do I not uh, for this particular role? Um, I mean, maybe we could have gotten to work as well. This and, is me. Yep. No, I was going to ask the, the create permission is because there are no information yet, you mean? Uh, effectively, the, yes. Yeah. In the ACL registry. Yes, yeah. Okay. So it's a bit simpler because yeah, there's no information yet and this create permission will inject the first permission or the first amount of information. Uh, but grant permission will happen afterwards. So there's already some information inside. And if we were to try to use another auth role, um, I think it would get awkward. I mean, maybe we could find a way around, but we just kind of settled on there being, again, an only owner with a permission manager uh, for each role. Uh, but here, so grant and revoke are the ones that we need to care about for the final forwarder. So here, if I try to grant myself a new permission. It's going to go in. I'm going to go through. And now if I go to the end, if I go to it, uh, we'll find that the method is grant permission, but it doesn't have any roles. But still, you know, there is this only permission manager. Um, and you know, there's a couple of ways that we could have solved this, really. We could have lifted this up as another Aragon OS level concept, but it didn't quite make sense because it's only relevant to the ACL. Uh, and so what we did was we said, well, there's no role, but we know who has to call it. And this is what we mean by the final forwarder. The final forwarder. Can you, can you repeat that? Yeah. So in the case of the ACL, right, we're still protecting this action with uh, with an auth check. Just we're doing the auth check slightly differently. Um, we're, we're saying only this permission manager is able to call it. And we see in the permission manager that, uh, if I go all the way to the top here, um, you know, one of these, the manager is gonna be one of these addresses and it can only ever be one address because it's an only owner type of setup. Now, because of this, right, we effectively know like, well, when we do the pathing, it's like, who can call this? 
So if I kind of, actually this is too big to copy. Let me do this. So we know the manager is zero, is, is voting. Let's call it voting. I'm just gonna delete this row. All right, so we know the manager for the role is voting, right? So uh, because of this, and because this is an only owner check, we know that you know the only person who can call it must be voting. Like th there's no other way for, for this person to call it. So yeah, only he can call uh, grant permission, right? Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yep. if if we look at the only only permission manager, you can see uh, the sender of the transaction must be the permission manager, who is an address in return. So it's only a single address that's possible. So we've effectively kind of cheated in some way with this concept and said, yeah, it has to be this guy, it has to be the manager who calls it. So then the, the algorithm changes slightly and says, instead of checking roles directly now, um, am I the final forwarder? Am I the manager? And if we have kind of two cases here, if we had a separate case where the manager was me, was user, it's very clear that only the user can do this and we simply check is this guy that guy and if so we can do it right and so that's kind of what this is uh what this check is for this the second half of the if uh in this case unfortunately we are not the final forwarder voting is the final forwarder um, so then what we do is we say well like rather than having to go through this whole complex process like we can kick start it by saying we know here, we, let's start transaction pathing from here. Uh, and that's all that's doing. Um, this is just uh, saying that, um, yeah, the final forwarder was given, um, but you know none of the existing forwarders, it's not us, it's not one of the existing forwarders, so there's no way that this can be done. Uh, like We have no idea how this can be done. Somebody else external to this organization must be calling it. In this case, that's not true. We have voting as the final forwarder. So we simply say, yeah, only this guy uh, can do it. And let's start the proper transaction packing algorithm with this guy starting. Uh, you'll notice that it's effectively the same afterwards. And really what this has given us is just a hint to say, okay, we are able to reduce the problem space even more. From here, right, we had like, in, in actuality, the diagrams, we had three apps potentially possible as forwarders from this step forward. Uh, but from here, we know it's only voting. Uh, and so we can begin with a much simplified um, graph and start doing like transaction pathing. And one question is, this uh, transaction path would be only necessary for a grant and remove and remove uh, action. No, there are no other use cases. Yes. Of having a final forward. Yes. So there's two cases, one of which we currently have and one of which we currently don't. Uh, the current use case is yes, grant and revoke permissions from the ACL. Uh, the next step is kind of the 10x difficulty jump and it's going between organizations um, and this is really interesting yeah. because you can have an agent yeah, yeah. right yeah as you're understanding this like we have effectively organization one over here and we have an agent in organization two over here and let me just 
draw the border briefly. And now user is sitting over here, right? And so he's got to go through multiple steps. Um, That's cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would be nice. Right, and, and, and so we could kind of do that in, in some way. Um, if we know that, you know, the path must end at the agent and like other things have to go on in a different organization for that to happen. Uh, now the reality of this is like unclear, um, but <laughs> possible. Why do you, what do you think? Why do you think uh, this uh, grant only? I mean, uh, only manager type of check is necessary in case of of uh, using uh, trying to calculate a path between organizations in case one is trying to revoke or assign a role to other one. Um, sorry, I don't understand. Can you repeat, Gabby? Yeah. Uh, what I what I mean is, why do you think what what you were mentioning that the two use cases were uh, the one that assign and revoke and the other one would be having agents of two organizations calculate, yep. calculating the path between them. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I mean, why do you say so? I'm, I'm not seeing how the only manager type check is related to uh, the two orgs calling with each other. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, effectively, it's kind of the same thing because uh, with an agent, we would say the agent is the final forwarder for uh, this organization. Because it, yes. if you just kind of ignore this organization and treat it as a black box, it's like, well, or perhaps this one, you're like, okay, yeah. I can only interact with the agent and henceforth, it must be a final forwarder. And then I'm going to use that to do transaction pathing on this side. Um, actually, maybe that's not true. Maybe I'm confusing things because maybe maybe what you actually want to do is replace the sender to be the agent when you do that second transaction path. Um, yeah, that would probably work better actually. So maybe that's not a use case. Maybe we would do transaction pathing for the agent and then from the agent, we would do another set of transaction pathing for the sender uh, for the second organization. What I was thinking was like, so there's two flows, right? We could either go forward uh, in terms of transaction path, transaction path, or we could go backward in terms of, I know I want to do A, and so I'm going to do transaction pathing and see what's possible with the agent. And then from here, go backwards. Um, but yeah, I don't I actually don't think it is that relevant then that the final forwarder is an agent. Um, but I'm yeah, not super sure. Haven't really thought this whole multi org yeah. pathing bit through entirely. But I I think we can no. go either way. Um, okay. But we would probably want to go backwards. The reason why we go backwards in transaction pathing, why we do this breadth first search is it's kind of like the same concept as the graph that I was talking about. It's a maze. And we want to start with the maze somewhere, right? And the way I look at it when I think about transaction pathing is the user is the end of the maze and the target contract is the start of the maze rather than the other way around. Uh, and this is, I prefer it this way because we have more information going backwards from the target because of permissions. Remember, permissions are, are kind of flowing backwards. Yep. They're saying who is allowed well, to do this. And because of that, um, rather than saying, what can the user do? We're instead saying, he wants to do this. Who's allowed to do that? OK, then who's allowed to do that? And then who's allowed yeah, to yeah. do that? Yeah, I think there is a, a, a name for that kind of search as well. But uh, yeah, I don't know like yeah, this, uh, algorithm or something like that. Yeah, you mean like uh, backtracking? Yeah, but there is a, yeah, some uh, algorithm to that. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, interesting to, to use the agent. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely a backtracking algorithm because it's breadth first. Uh, 
I mean, both death first and, and breath first are, are backtracking algorithms in a graph. Um, it's just, do you start at the front or do you start at the back? Um, there's no kind of fancy algorithms here because every weight has a weight of one. Um, but that's another thing that we could explore in the future, right? If you could weight different edges, then you can start building shortest paths. And that's when you want Ooh, to get into yeah. the more fun graph. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, indeed. You will need an extra uh, information in that artifacts or something. Yeah, I, I mean, I have no idea. I mean, an organization could then <laughs> say, for example, that uh, relative weighting, um, I prefer this path over that path or this edge over that edge uh, by a factor of two or 10 or whatever. And people based on their permissions and agreements or whatnot um, could then start selecting shortest paths or et cetera. But th this is really theoretical at, at this point. And yeah, I yeah. think it's really useful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, in, in the case of this multi-org transaction path, I think we would again want to start backwards. We want to start here, see what's available uh, using probably an agent that we control um, and, and using that as a sender. And then when we get back to saying, okay, looks like the agent can actually execute this. Then we go back and say, how do we execute the agent from here? Um, and that probably makes the makes more sense, again, going backwards than forwards because of what we just talked about with permissions. Okay. All right. So a lot of talking. <laughs> um, any Anything in, in this regard? Otherwise, we can go to the final, final topic with the intent basket. Yeah. Just a very random question. Um, the graph formed by the permissions, it's not a tree, right? It's just a regular graph. It can have cycles, yes. OK, it can have, OK, OK. Yeah. I mean, we already have a cycle in most default organizations. Uh, so I, it depends on what you call a cycle, because like, if we call each action, uh, its own thing. It's not really a cycle, but in terms of forwarders, yes. Yeah, are. I guess like, yeah, I guess like I would want to view it as like how you form the transaction path itself. You used to define what's the graph. Yeah, you can have cycles. Um, the the okay. again, the easiest example of this is minting tokens. Uh, so if I still have the right permissions. I need to delete this one. Uh, easiest way to, to see this is, yeah. By default tokens, the only person who can create tokens is voting. And the only one who can create votes is tokens. So you have a cycle there. Oh, nice. OK. Uh, yeah. So once that reaches, if I do this, you should see that. Did this work? Yes. So you'll see, yeah, oh, no, no, mm, let me try that again. No, I definitely should not be able to do that. <laughs> Did this not work? Oh, there we go, no? Oh, I had to go vote. That's right, I had to go vote. But yeah, like the reason of my question was like, if the like if the permissions graph was guaranteed to be a tree, uh, we definitely have a way to find like the shortest path. Uh, always, it gets a bit more complicated, but like there is a way. But if it's just like a regular graph, you can have cycles. Then yeah, it's not that easy. Yeah, I would say we shouldn't have cycles um, in the path itself. The only time we can have a cycle is with the final action. So if we ignore this part, so if we just do everything on this side, that should be a tree. If there's a cycle there, there's a problem. We're going to get stuck in an infinite loop at some point. Uh, but if we include the whole thing, then we can have a cycle. Again, tokens, loading tokens. Oh, yeah. I see. I see. Um, but yeah, that's a good point, uh, definitely, right? So tokens voting, and it's going to do something on, yeah, it's going to do something on voting. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a good point to take into account that 
effectively once we take away this uh, we should be looking for a tree and we can start eliminating potential um, apps from the list if we know there are they've already been burned yeah if they're already in the list mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's actually a very interesting property yeah actually that's not true we just can't have direct cycles yeah i, I think that, i think you can have cycles because you can have like tokens allows you to do this which then allows you to do that which then requires a token holder which then i mean a token holder is a bit is a bit contrived because it's not like apps will generally have tokens uh, but it can definitely hit the same app twice but just do something different uh, on the second wave yeah. Like, yeah yeah i think yeah. i thought about this before and i think i'm pretty sure we can have cycles uh with some awkward examples none of which are like realistic in, in today's world but theoretically <laughs> yes yeah yeah probably have cycles. It's awesome. yeah yeah okay um yeah before we move on final check um everything good yep okay yep. yeah right. you're, you're live yep uh then then the intent basket is a bit of a final um, footnote in how we do transaction pathing. Uh, the most obvious use case of this is with updating organizations. So if this loads, hopefully it will. So when you see this, um, right. So what this is going to do, hopefully it works. If not, it's going to suck. There we go. All right. So, um, an intent basket is what we were talking about here when we could have more than two actions happen inside the uh, EVM script. Uh, and it's called a basket because we're thinking about the, the shopping cart uh, analogy. Um, so what actually happens here when this happens is when you update your organization, we're actually updating four apps and that's four separate transactions that happen. So if we look inside a different organization that's done this, it's just taking a while to sync. You can tell that this is an old org. Uh, just by the time it's taking to sync. And uh, of course, this is on Rinkeby and not optimized. So, um, did I not update this? No, I must have updated this. Uh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, so this is what happens. This is what actually happens when you update um, an organization from 0 0.6 or 0 0.7 to 0. Sorry, 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 slash 0 0.8. Um, effectively, we encoded four actions in the same EVM script um, that all get applied at the same time uh, in a vote. Usually, that's in a vote. Um, and again, it's very similar to this. If we just look at these two executes, we can just imagine four executes happening. Um, in terms of how this is done, um, if we look at the intent basket, it's a small trick, but effectively we just tell it, okay, we're gonna do transaction pathing, but instead of just one transaction path, we're gonna go calculate all of the transaction paths of everything in the basket. Um, so you'll see in the basket, it's an array of an array, and that effectively are, uh, means like what we'd like to do. Uh, so here, instead of just one, we would then have two, and then we would start calculating transaction paths for all of them. Um, all of this is very similar to transaction pathing. It really is just the start, um, what we do at the start to try and find the transaction path, and there's two modes. Uh, we only use one right now because it's otherwise very slow, but we say, okay, given the intent basket, do we think they're all the same? And that's the check mode. If it's single, 
we're only going to go check one of them. And this works very well for updating our organizations because you'll see all of these are the same. Uh, they all do the same thing on the kernel or similar things on the kernel. And so there shouldn't be any weird permissions that arise between the two of them. Um, and so, yeah, effectively we just say, okay, there's like four actions or multiple actions in this basket. Uh, go check, you know, whether or not that's possible. And once you've checked either all of them or just one of them, let's just double check to make sure that they all line up. They're all using the same forwarders. And if they do, um, that's this part here, do intent paths match. If they do, we just, uh, we just return an encoded version of the, of the path. Um, and this is really just transaction pathing just with multiple endpoints, uh, multiple individual transactions in the EVM script at the end. This, in, this uh, has the requirement that all the actions need to be uh, possible with a sender. Yes, yeah. Okay. yeah. This basket has to be entirely possible from the user, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it works well in cases where you have a giant bottleneck like voting. Uh, for example, most organizations, everything is controlled through voting right now. So uh, this is, yeah, this is effectively what happens. Everything just gets routed through voting. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's that's everything on the list. Um, any other questions, um, areas that we would like to get into but didn't? Uh, no, that I can think of. We cover a lot. <laughs> okay, everything kind of makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. If I uh, yeah. if I asked you to let, let's say I deleted Aragon JS tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, I I wouldn't use uh, that many events. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> or at least in Google. Yeah. Okay. Um, and anyway, I mean, the, the code in Aragon JS is not the easiest to read, but it is available. Um, the transaction part, the transaction pathing part, uh, really just requires what I was doing with the debugger to go through and like see what it's doing to understand it better, and as well draw diagrams as you're doing that. Um, and you know, we were talking a lot, a, a lot about you know ways to improve it uh, using the the ACL information and where we should go to network and where we shouldn't. And those are definitely things we should take into account. Uh, I think one of the big things about, you know, uh, about the new tooling, um, transaction pathing is, is definitely fundamental to the, the base experience. Like we absolutely need to offer transaction pathing. Uh, we need to offer an O1 lookup for organizational state. So it's just like, you know, 300 milliseconds, one network request, you have all that information. And then from there, it should be really, really simple for someone to go take that and do transaction pathing with it. Um, and hopefully not, not go to network too many times when they do that, they should just be able to find a couple paths and we can offer them like, which one do you want to try um, and create transactions out of them. All right. Yeah, I agree. Nice. That was super <laughs> insightful. All right, guys. Then in that case, um, yeah, let me know if you have any other questions. Uh, but we can adjourn for now. And let's talk uh, about how we design the new API. Uh, I think as yeah. we said as well, the, the, probably the first steps is to design the, the schema and try a couple of things with the graph, see what's possible, see what's not. Yeah. And go from there. That's true. That's yeah. true. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, how are you feeling, Pierre? 
Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, th thanks for this. It was a super in-depth uh, overview of uh, everything.